Part One of the Introduction to the Six Books of Proclus, the Platonic Successor on the Theology of Plato, translated from the Greek, to which a seventh book is added, in order to supply the deficiency of another book on this subject, which was written by Proclus but since lost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Platonic Theology by Proclus Translated by Thomas Taylor To William Meredith, Esquire, who, with a firmness and munificence unparalleled in modern times, has patronized the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, and its English promulgator, as an acknowledgment of no common esteem for his character, and a tribute of the warmest gratitude for his patronage, this work is dedicated by the translator Thomas Taylor. Introduction I rejoice in the opportunity which is afforded me of presenting the truly philosophic reader, in the present work, with a treasure of Grecian theology, of a theology which was first mystically and symbolically promulgated by Orpheus, afterwards disseminated enigmatically through images by Pythagoras, and in the last place scientifically unfolded by Plato and his genuine disciples. The peculiarity indeed of this theology is that it is no less scientific than sublime, and that by a geometrical series of reasoning originating from the most self-evident truths, it develops all the deified progressions from the ineffable principle of things, and accurately exhibits to our view all the links of that golden chain of which deity is the one extreme, and body the other. That also which is most admirable and laudable in this theology is that it produces in the mind properly prepared for its reception the most pure, holy, venerable, and exalted conceptions of the great cause of all. For it celebrates this immense principle as something superior even to being itself, as exempt from the whole of things of which it is nevertheless ineffably the source, and does not therefore think fit to conumerate it with any triad or order of beings. Indeed, it even apologizes for attempting to give an appropriate name to this principle, which is in reality ineffable, and ascribes the attempt to the imbecility of human nature, which, striving intently to behold it, gives the appellation of the most simple of its conceptions to that which is beyond all knowledge and all conception. Hence it denominates it the One, and the Good, by the former of these names indicating its transcendent simplicity, and by the latter its subsistence as the object of desire to all beings. For all things desire good. At the same time, however, it asserts that these appellations are in reality nothing more than the parturitions of the soul, which, standing as it were, in the vestibules of the aditum of deity, announce nothing pertaining to the ineffable, but only indicate her spontaneous tendencies towards it, and belong rather to the immediate offspring of the first god, than to the first itself. Hence, as the result of this most venerable conception of the supreme, when it ventures not only to denominate the ineffable, but also to assert something of its relation to other things, 
it considers this as preeminently its peculiarity, that it is the principle of principles, it being necessary that the characteristic property of principle, after the same manner as other things, should not begin from multitude, but should be collected into one monad as a summit, and which is the principle of all principles. Conformably to this, Proclus, in the second book of this work, says, with matchless magnificence of diction, quote, Let us, as it were, celebrate the first God, not as establishing the earth and the heavens, nor as giving subsistence to souls and the generation of all animals. For he produced these indeed, but among the last of things. But prior to these, let us celebrate him as unfolding into light the whole intelligible and intellectual genus of gods, together with all the supermundane and mundane divinities, as the god of all gods, the unity of all unities, and beyond the first adita, as more ineffable than all silence, and more unknown than all essence, as holy among the holies, and concealed in the intelligible gods. Close quote. The scientific reasoning from which this dogma is deduced is the following. As the principle of all things is the one, it is necessary that the progression of beings should be continued, and that no vacuum should intervene either in incorporeal or corporeal natures. It is also necessary that every thing which has a natural progression should proceed through similitude. In consequence of this, it is likewise necessary that every producing principle should generate a number of the same order with itself, videreliket, nature, a natural number, soul, one that is psychical, edest, belonging to soul, and intellect, an intellectual number. For if whatever possesses a power of generating generates similars prior to dissimilars, every cause must deliver its own form and characteristic peculiarity to its progeny, and before it generates that which gives subsistence to progressions far distant and separate from its nature, it must constitute things proximate to itself, according to essence, and conjoined with it through similitude. It is therefore necessary from these premises, since there is one unity, the principle of the universe, that this unity should produce from itself, prior to everything else, a multitude of natures characterized by unity, and a number the most of all things allied to its cause, and these natures are no other than the gods. According to this theology, therefore, from the immense principle of principles, in which all things causally subsist, absorbed in superessential light, and involved in unfathomable depths, a beauteous progeny of principles proceed, all largely partaking of the ineffable, all stamped with the occult characters of deity, all possessing an overflowing fullness of good. From these dazzling summits, these ineffable blossoms, these divine propagations, being, life, intellect, soul, nature, and body depend, monads suspended from unities, deified natures proceeding from deities. Each of these monads, too, is the leader of a series which extends from itself to the last of things, and which, while it proceeds from, 
at the same time abides in and returns to its leader. And all these principles and all their progeny are finally centered and rooted by their summits in the first great all-comprehending one. Thus all beings proceed from and are comprehended in the first being. All intellects emanate from one first intellect. All souls from one first soul. All natures blossom from one first nature. And all bodies proceed from the vital and luminous body of the world. And lastly, all these great monads are comprehended in the first one, from which both they and all their depending series are unfolded into light. Hence this first one is truly the unity of unities, the monad of monads, the principle of principles, the god of gods, one and all things, and yet one prior to all. No objections of any weight, no arguments but such as are sophistical, can be urged against this most sublime theory, which is so congenial to the unperverted conceptions of the human mind, that it can only be treated with ridicule and contempt in degraded, barren, and barbarous ages. Ignorance and priestcraft, however, have hitherto conspired to defame those inestimable works in which this and many other grand and important dogmas can alone be found. And the theology of the Greeks has been attacked with all the insane fury of ecclesiastical zeal and all the imbecile flashes of mistaken wit by men whose conceptions on the subject like those of a man between sleeping and waking, have been turbid and wild, fantastic and confused, preposterous and vain. Indeed, that after the great incomprehensible cause of all, a divine multitude subsists, cooperating with this cause in the production and government of the universe, has always been and is still admitted by all nations and all religions however much they may differ in their opinions respecting the nature of the subordinate deities and the veneration which is to be paid to them by man and however barbarous the conceptions of some nations on this subject may be when compared with those of others hence says the elegant Maximus Turius, quote, You will see one according law and assertion in all the earth, that there is one God, the King and Father of all things, and many gods, sons of God, ruling together with him. This the Greek says, and the barbarian says, the inhabitant of the continent, and he who dwells near the sea, the wise and the unwise. And if you proceed as far as to the utmost shores of the ocean, there also there are gods, rising very near to some, and setting very near to others. Close quote. This dogma, too, is so far from being opposed by either the Old or New Testament that it is admitted by both, though it forbids the religious veneration of the inferior deities, and enjoins the worship of one God alone, whose portion is Jacob, and Israel the line of his inheritance. The following testimonies will, I doubt not, convince the liberal reader of the truth of this assertion. In the first place, it appears from the thirty-second chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 8, in the Septuagint version, that, quote, 
the division of the nations was made according to the number of the angels of God, close quote, and not according to the number of the children of Israel, as the present Hebrew text asserts. This reading was adopted by the most celebrated fathers of the Christian Church, such as among the Greeks, Origen, Basil, and Chrysostom, and among the Latins, Jerome and Gregory. That this too is the genuine reading is evident from the fourth chapter of the same book, and the nineteenth verse, in which it is said, quote, and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. Close quote. Here it is said, that the stars are divided to all the nations, which is equivalent to saying that the nations were divided according to the number of the stars. A Jewish legislator, at the same time, considering his own nation as an exception, and as being under the government of the God of Israel alone. For in the following verse it is added, quote, but the Lord hath taken you, Edest the Jews, and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are to this day. Close quote. By the angels of God, therefore, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, the stars are signified and these in the same book chapter seventeen verse three are expressly called gods quote, and hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven which i have not commanded Close quote. in the third chapter also and the twenty-fourth verse it is implied in the question which is there asked that the god of the jews is superior to all the celestial and terrestrial gods Quote, for what god is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might Close quote. as the attention of the jews was solely confined to the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they but little regarded the powers whom they conceived to be subordinate to this God, and considering all of them as merely the messengers of their God, they gave them the general appellation of angels, though, as we shall shortly prove, from the testimony of the Apostle Paul, they were not consistent in confounding angels properly so called with gods. But that the stars are not called gods by the Jewish legislator as things inanimate like statues fashioned of wood or stone is evident from what is said in the book of Job and the Psalms. Quote, Behold, even the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man which is a worm. Close quote. Job, chapter 25, verses 5 and 6. And, quote, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him Close quote. psalm eight verses three and four it is evident therefore from these passages that the heavens 
and the stars are more excellent than man. But nothing inanimate can be more excellent than that which is animated. To which may be added that in the following verse David says that God has made man a little lower than the angels. But the stars, as we have shown, were considered by Moses as angels and gods, and consequently they are animated beings, and superior to man. Farther still, in the Septuagint version of verse the fourth of the nineteenth psalm, God is said to have placed his tabernacle in the sun. En to elio etheto to skenama autu, which is doubtless the genuine reading, and not that of the vulgar translation. Quote, in them, edest the heavens, hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Close quote. For this is saying nothing more of the sun than what may be said of any of the other stars, and produces in us no exalted conception of the artificer of the universe. But to say that God dwells in the sun gives us a magnificent idea both of that glorious luminary and the deity who dwells enshrined, as it were, in dazzling splendor, to which we may add, in confirmation of this version of the Septuagint, that in Psalm 11, verse 4, it is said, quote, The Lord's throne is in heaven. Close quote. And again, in Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 1, Quote, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Close quote. If, therefore, the heavens are the throne, and the sun the tabernacle of deity, they must evidently be deified. For nothing can come into immediate contact with divinity without being divine. Hence, says Simplicius, quote, that it is connascent with the human soul to think the celestial bodies are divine is especially evident from those, the Jews, who look to these bodies through preconceptions about divine natures. For they also say that the heavens are the habitation of God and the throne of God, and are alone sufficient to reveal the glory and excellence of God to those who are worthy. Than which assertions, what can be more venerable? Close quote. Indeed, that the heavens are not the inanimate throne and residence of deity is also evident from the assertion in the nineteenth psalm. Quote, that the heavens declare the glory of God. Close quote. For Rabbi Moses, a very learned Jew, says quote, that the word sephar, to declare or set forth, is never attributed to things inanimate. Close quote. Hence he concludes quote, that the heavens are not without some soul which, says he, is no other than that of those blessed intelligences who govern the stars, and dispose them into such letters as God has ordained, declaring unto us men, by means of this writing, what events we are to expect. And hence this same writing is called by all the ancients, Chetab ha Melachim that is to say, the writing of the angels. Close quote. The gods, therefore, which were distributed to all the nations but the Jews, were the sun and moon and the other celestial bodies, yet not so far as they are bodies, 
but so far as they are animated beings. Hence, the Hebrew prophets never reprobate and prohibit the worship of the stars as things which neither see, nor hear, nor understand, as they do the worship of statues. Thus, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 28, quote, And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. Close quote. And the psalmist, quote, They have a mouth, but speak not, etc. Close quote. These, and many other things of the like kind, are said by the prophets of the Jews against the worship of images and statues, but never of the sun and moon and the other stars. But when they blame the worship of the heavenly bodies, they assign as the cause that the people of Israel are not attributed to them as other nations are, in consequence of being the inheritance of the God that brought them out of the land of Egypt, and out of the house of bondage. This is evident from the before-cited passage in the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy, in which it is said that the stars are divided unto all nations under the whole heaven but the Jews. Indeed, as the Emperor Julian justly observes, quote, Unless a certain ethnarchic god presides over every nation, and under this god there is an angel, a demon, and a peculiar genus of souls, subservient and ministrant to more excellent natures, from which the difference in laws and manners arises, unless this is admitted, let it be shown by any other how this difference is produced. For it is not sufficient to say, quote, God said, and it was done, close quote. But it is requisite that the natures of things which are produced should accord with the mandates of divinity. But I will explain more clearly what I mean. God, for instance, commanded that fire should tend upward, and earthly masses downward. Is it not therefore requisite, in order that the mandate of God may be accomplished, that the former should be light, and the latter heavy? Thus also, in a similar manner, in other things. Thus too, in divine concerns. But the reason of this is, because the human race is frail and corruptible. Hence also the works of man are corruptible and mutable, and subject to all various revolutions. But God, being eternal, it is also fit that his mandates should be eternal. And being such, they are either the natures of things, or conformable to the natures of things. For how can nature contend with the mandate of divinity? How can it fall off from this concord? If, therefore, as he ordered, that there should be a confusion of tongues, and that they should not accord with each other, so likewise he ordered that the political concerns of nations should be discordant. He has not only effected this by his mandate, but has rendered us naturally adapted to this dissonance. For, to effect this, it would be requisite, in the first place, that the natures of those should be different, whose political concerns among nations are to be different. This, indeed, is seen in bodies if any one directs his attention to the Germans and Scythians, and considers how much the bodies of these differ from those of the Libyans and Ethiopians. Is this, therefore, a mere mandate, 
and does the air contribute nothing, nor the relation and position of the region with respect to the celestial bodies. Close quote. Julian adds, quote, Moses, however, though he knew the truth of this, concealed it, nor does he ascribe the confusion of tongues to God alone. For he says that not only God descended, nor one alone with him, but many, though he does not say who they were. But it is very evident that he conceived those who descended with God to be similar to him. If, therefore, not the Lord only, but those who were with him contributed to this confusion of tongues, they may justly be considered as the causes of this dissonance. Close quote. In short, that the heavens and the celestial bodies are animated by certain divine souls was not only the opinion of the ancient poets and philosophers, but also of the most celebrated fathers of the church, and the most learned and acute of the schoolmen. Thus, for instance, this is asserted by Jerome in his exposition of the sixth verse of the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, and by Origen in his book on principles, who says that the heavenly bodies must be animated because they are said to receive the mandates of God, which is only consentaneous to a rational nature. This too is asserted by Eusebius in his Theological Solutions, and by Augustine in his Enchiridion. Among the schoolmen, too, this was the opinion of Albertus Magnus in his book De Quatuor Quaequivis, of Thomas Aquinas in his treatise De Spiritualibus Creaturis, and of Johannes Scotus Super Secundo Sententiarum. To these likewise may be added the most learned cardinal, Nicolaus Cusanus. Aureolus, indeed, strenuously contends for the truth of this opinion, and does not even think it improper to venerate the celestial bodies with outward worship, dulii cultu, and to implore their favor and assistance. And Thomas Aquinas says that he has no other objection to this than that it might be the occasion of idolatry. Hence, though it may seem ridiculous to most of the present time that divine souls should be placed in the stars and preside over regions and cities, tribes and people, nations and tongues, yet it did not appear so to the more intelligent Christians of former times. I had almost forgotten, however, the wisest of the ancient Christians. But, as he was the best of them, I have done well in reserving him to the last, and this is no other than the Platonic bishop, Synesius. This father of the church, therefore, in his third hymn, sings as follows. Say, Pater Cosmon, Pater Ionon, Auturge Theon, Euages Ainen. Se men oi noeroi, melpusin, anax, se de cosmagoi, omatolampis, noes asterioi, umnusi macar, us peri clenon soma coreui. Passa se melpe genea macaron, oi peri cosmon, oi kata cosmon, oi Stonaioi, oi te asdonoi, cosmu moiras efepusi, sophoi amphibateres, oi paraclinus, oi ecophorus, us agelica procee, 
Sere to te kudean genos eron ega ta theneton crufiaisin odois dianisomenon erga protea psuka t aclines kai clinomena es melanoges chthonius ogcus we dare licet quote the father of the worlds father of the eons artificer of the gods it is holy to praise the o king the intellectual gods sing the o blessed god the cosmagi those fulgid eyes and starry intellects celebrate round which the illustrious body of the world dances all the race of the blessed sing thy praise those that are about and those that are in the world the zonic gods and also the azonic who govern the parts of the world wise itinerants stationed about the illustrious pilots of the universe and which the angelic series pours forth the two the renowned genus of heroes celebrates which by occult paths pervades the works of mortals and likewise the soul which does not incline to the regions of mortality and the soul which descends into dark terrestrial masses Close quote. in another part also of the same hymn he informs us that he adored the powers that preside over thrace and chalcedon iketeusa theos thrace teras osoi gonimon thraces catecusi pedon oite antiperon chalcedonias ephepusi guias it is i have supplicated the ministrant gods that possess the thracian soil and also those that in an opposite direction govern the chalcedonian land and in the last place he says in him one nos athitos tokion theokoidonon aporox oligomen al echenon olos utos is te pante olos is olon deducos kutos uranon elise to de olon tuto fulason nene me menai si morphai me mer ismenos pereste o men asteron de freos o de es agalon coreas o de kai reponti desmon chthonian eureto morphan the substance of which is quote, that incorruptible intellect which is wholly an emanation of divinity is totally diffused through the whole world convolves the heavens and preserves the universe with which it is present distributed in various forms that one part of this intellect is distributed among the stars and becomes as it were their charioteer but another part among the angelic choirs and another part is bound in a terrestrial form Close quote. end of part one of the introduction Part two of the introduction to Platonic Theology by Proclus, translated by Thomas Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I confess I am wholly at a loss to conceive what could induce the moderns to controvert the dogma that the stars and the whole world are animated 
as it is an opinion of infinite antiquity, and is friendly to the most unperverted, spontaneous, and accurate conceptions of the human mind. Indeed, the rejection of it appears to me to be just as absurd as it would be in a maggot, if it were capable of syllogizing, to infer that man is a machine impelled by some external force when he walks, because it never saw any animated reptile so large. The sagacious Kepler, for so he is called, even by the most modern writers, appears to have had a conception of this great truth. But, as he was more an astronomer than a philosopher, he saw this truth only partially, and he rather embraced it as subservient to his own astronomical opinions than as forming an essential part of the true theory of the universe. But from what I have seen of the writings of Kepler, I have no doubt, if he had lived in the time of the Greeks, or if he had made the study of the works of Plato and Aristotle the business of his life, he would have become an adept in, and an illustrious and zealous champion of their philosophy. Kepler then, in Harmonicus Mundi, Liber 4, page 158, says, quote, that he does not oppose the dogma that there is a soul of the universe, though he shall say nothing about it in that book. He adds that if there is such a soul, it must reside in the centre of the world, which, according to him, is the sun, and from thence, by the communication of the rays of light, which are in the place of spirits in an animated body, is propagated into all the amplitude of the world. Close quote. In the following passages also he confidently asserts that the earth has a soul, for he says quote, that the globe of the earth is a body such as is that of some animal, and that what its own soul is to an animal, that the sublunary nature which he investigates will be to the earth. Close quote. He adds, quote, that he sees for the most part everything which, proceeding from the body of an animal, testifies that there is a soul in it, proceeds also from the body of the earth. For, as the animated body produces in the superficies of the skin hairs, thus also the earth produces on its surface plants and trees and as in the former lice are generated, so in the latter the worms called erukai, grasshoppers, and various insects and marine monsters are produced. As the animated body likewise produces tears, mucus, and the recrement of the ears, and sometimes gum from the pustules of the face, Thus also the earth produces amber and bitumen. As the bladder too produces urine, thus likewise mountains pour forth rivers. And as the body produces excrement of a sulphurous odor, and crepitus, which may also be inflamed, so the earth produces sulphur, subterranean fires, thunder, and lightning. And, as in the veins of an animal blood is generated, and together with it sweat, which is ejected out of the body, so in the veins of the earth metals and fossils and a rainy vapor are generated. Close quote. And in Capitulum 7, page 163, after having shown that there is in the earth the sense of touching, that it respires and is subject in certain parts to languors, and internal vicissitudes of the viscera, 
and that subterranean heat proceeds from the soul of the earth, he adds, quote, that a certain image of the zodiac is resplendent in this soul, and therefore of the whole firmament, and is the bond of the sympathy of things celestial and terrestrial. Close quote. Bishop Barclay also was by no means hostile to this opinion that the world is one great animal, as is evident from the following extract from his Cirrus, page 131. Quote, blind fate and blind chance are at bottom much the same thing, and one no more intelligible than the other. Such is the mutual relation, connection, motion, and sympathy of the parts of this world, that they seem, as it were, animated, and held together by one soul. And such is their harmony, order, and regular course, as shows the soul to be governed and directed by a mind. It was an opinion of remote antiquity that the world was an animal. If we may trust the Hermaic writings, the Egyptians thought all things did partake of life. This opinion was also so general and current among the Greeks that Plutarch asserts all others held the world to be an animal and governed by providence, except Leucippus, Democritus, and Epicurus. And, although an animal containing all bodies within itself could not be touched or sensibly affected from without, yet it is plain they attributed to it an inward sense and feeling, as well as appetites and aversions, and that from all the various tones, actions, and passions of the universe, they supposed one symphony, one animal act, and life to result. Quote, Iamblichus declares the world to be one animal, in which the parts however distant each from other, are nevertheless related and connected by one common nature. And he teaches what is also a received notion of the Pythagoreans and Platonics, that there is no chasm in nature, but a chain or scale of beings rising by gentle, uninterrupted gradations from the lowest to the highest each nature being informed and perfected by the participation of a higher. As air becomes igneous, so the purest fire becomes animal, and the animal soul becomes intellectual, which is to be understood not of the change of one nature into another, but of the connection of different natures each lower nature being, according to those philosophers, as it were a receptacle or subject for the next above it to reside and act in. Quote, it is also the doctrine of Platonic philosophers that intellect is the very life of living things, the first principle and exemplar of all, from whence by different degrees are derived the inferior classes of life, first the rational, then the sensitive, after that the vegetable, but so as in the rational animal there is still somewhat intellectual, again in the sensitive there is somewhat rational, and in the vegetable somewhat sensitive, and lastly in mixed bodies as metals and minerals, somewhat of vegetation, by which means the whole is thought to be more perfectly connected, which doctrine implies that all the faculties, instincts, and motions of inferior beings in their several respective subordinations are derived from and depend upon intellect. Quote, both Stoics and Platonics held the world to be alive, 
though sometimes it be mentioned as a sentient animal, sometimes as a plant or vegetable. But in this, notwithstanding what has been surmised by some learned men, there seems to be no atheism. For so long as the world is supposed to be quickened by elementary fire or spirit, which is itself animated by soul and directed by understanding, it follows that all parts thereof originally depend upon, and may be reduced unto the same indivisible stem or principle, to wit a supreme mind, which is the concurrent doctrine of Pythagoreans, Platonics, and Stoics. Close quote. Compare now the Newtonian with this theory, that the heavenly bodies are vitalized by their informing souls, that their orderly motion is the result of this vitality, and that the planets move harmonically round the sun, not as if urged by a centripetal force, but from an animated tendency to the principle and fountain of their light, and from a desire of partaking as largely as possible of his influence and power. In the former theory, all the celestial motions are the effect of violence. In the latter, they are all natural. The former is attended with insuperable difficulties. The latter, when the principle on which it is founded, is admitted with none and the former is unscientific and merely hypothetical, but the latter is the progeny of the most accurate science, and is founded on the most genuine and unperverted conceptions of the human mind. I have said that I should prove from the testimony of the Apostle Paul that the Jews were not consistent in confounding angels, properly so called, with gods and this appears to me to be evident, in the first place from the following passage in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Piste nomen catertisai tus ionos remati theu, es to me ec phenomenon ta plepomena gegonenai, this, in the English version, is erroneously rendered, quote, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Close quote. I say this is erroneously translated because, in the first place, the worlds is evidently a forced interpretation of Ionas, and, even admitting it is not, leaves the passage very ambiguous from the uncertainty to what worlds Paul alludes. If we adopt ages, which is the general sense of the word in the New Testament, we shall indeed avoid a forced and ambiguous interpretation but we shall render the meaning of the apostle trifling in the extreme. For, as he has elsewhere said, quote, that all things were framed by the word of God, close quote. what particular faith does it require to believe that by the same word he framed the ages? In the second place, from the definition of faith, given in the first verse of this chapter, that it is, quote, the evidence of things not seen, close quote. It is clear that Paul is speaking in this passage of something invisible. Since then, Ionus is neither worlds nor ages, what shall we say it is? I answer, the eons of the Valentinians. And, agreeably to this, the whole passage should be translated as follows. Quote, by faith we understand that the eons were framed by the word of God, in order that things which are seen 
might be generated from such as do not appear, videst, from things invisible. Close quote. Everyone who is much conversant with Greek authors must certainly be convinced that isto means in order that, and Bishop Pearson translates as I have done the latter part of this verse. Now we learn from the second book of Irenaeus against the heretics that according to the Valentinians all created things are the images of the eons, resident in the plerima or fullness of deity. And does it not clearly follow from the above version that according to Paul too the eons are the exemplars of visible or created things? To which we may add that this sense of the passage clearly accords with the assertion that quote, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Close quote. For here the things which do not appear are the eons, these, according to the Valentinians, subsisting in deity, so that from our version Paul might say with great propriety that quote, we understand by faith that the eons were framed by the word of God, in order that things which are seen might be generated from such as do not appear. Close quote. For this naturally follows from his definition of faith. I further add that among these eons of the Valentinians were nous, buthos, sige, Aletheia, Sophia, id est, intellect, a profundity, silence, truth, and wisdom, which, as Gale well observes in his notes on Iamblichus, de Musteris, etc., prove their dogmas to be of Chaldaic origin. For these words perpetually occur in the fragments of the Chaldaic oracles, and the middle of the Chaldean intelligible triad is denominated Ion, Eon, Edest, Eternity, and is also perfectly conformable to the theology of Plato, as is very satisfactorily shown by Proclus in the third book of the following work. According to the Chaldeans, therefore, the eons are gods, and considered as the exemplars of the visible universe. They are analogous to the ideas of Plato, which also are gods, as is evident from the Parmenides of that philosopher. According to Paul, too, as the eons are the fabricators of the visible world, they must be beings of a much higher order than angels, and consequently must be gods, productive power being one of the great characteristics of a divine nature. Again, in the Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 21, Paul says that God has exalted Christ, quote, far above every principality, and power, and might, and dominion. Close quote. Uperna passes arces cae exousias, cae dunameos, cae curiotetos. And in the sixth chapter and the twelfth verse, he conjoins with principalities and powers the rulers of the world, yet est, the seven planets. Pros tas arcas, pros tas exousias, pros tas cosmocratoras. Augustine confesses that he is ignorant what the difference is between those four words, principality, power, might, and dominion, in which the Apostle Paul seems to comprehend all the celestial society. Quote, Quid inter se distant quator illa vocabula, quibus universum ipsam coelestem 
societatem videtur apostolus esse complexus, dicant qui possunt, si tamen possunt probare quod dicunt, ego me ista ignorare fateor. Ignatius also in Epistola ad Trollianos speaks of the angelic orders, the diversities of archangels and armies, the differences of the orders characterized by might and dominion, of thrones and powers, the magnificence of the aeons, and the transcendency of cherubim and seraphim. Caegor ega u catho si dedemai, cae dunamai noin ta epuranai, cae tas agelicos taxes, cae tas ton arc agelon, cae stration exalegos, dunamion te cae curiotiton diaphoros, thronon te cae exusion paralegos, ionon de megalotites ton te cherubim cae seraphim tos aperucas. The opinion of Grotius, therefore, is highly probable that the Jews obtained the names of powers, dominations, and principalities from their Babylonic captivity. And Gale, in his notes on Iamblichus, says that certain passages of Zoroaster and Ostanus, cited by the author of Arithmetic Theology, confirm this opinion of Grotius. Indeed, the appellation of archai, principles, which are the first of the four powers mentioned by Paul, was given by the Chaldeans to that order of gods called by the Grecian theologists supermundane and assimilative, the nature of which is unfolded by Proclus in the sixth book of the following work, and Proclus in the fourth book of his manuscript, Commentary on the Parmenides of Plato, shows that the order of gods denominated noetus kai noeras intelligible and at the same time intellectual is according to the chaldean oracles principally characterized by domination in proof of this the two following oracles are cited by him the first concerning the empyrean and the second concerning the material synachus Toiste puros noeru noerois prester sin apanta e cathe duleuanta patros pethenidi bule. It is, quote, All things yield ministrant to the intellectual presters of intellectual fire through the persuasive will of the Father. Close quote. And Alakai ulaios osa duleue synocheusi. It is, quote, but likewise such as are in subjection to the material synocheus. Close quote. Farther still, Paul, in the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 38, says, quote, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, etc. From this arrangement, therefore, it is evident that principalities and powers are not the same with angels, and as, according to Paul, they are beings so exalted that in his epistle to the Ephesians he could not find anything more magnificent to say of Christ than that he is raised even above them. It follows that they must be gods, since they are superior to the angelic order. 
It is remarkable, too, that he co-arranges height and depth, upsama kai bathos, with principalities and powers, and bathos is one of the eons, according to the Valentinians. In the first epistle to the Corinthians, likewise, chapter 8, verse 5, Paul expressly asserts that there is a divine multitude, for he says, quote, Though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, parenthesis, as there be gods many and lords many, close parenthesis, close quote, in the parenthesis of which verse it is incontrovertibly evident that he admits the existence of a plurality of gods, though as well as the heathens he believed that one god only was supreme and the father of all things. Nor am I singular in asserting that this was admitted by Paul, for the pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite in the second chapter of his treatise on the divine names, observes concerning what is here said by Paul as follows, quote, Again, from the deific energy of God, by which everything, according to its ability, becomes deiform, many gods are generated, in consequence of which there appears and is said to be a separation and multiplication of the one supreme God. Nevertheless, God himself, who is the chief deity, and is superessentially the supreme, is still one God, remaining impartable in the gods distributed from him, united to himself, unmingled with the many, and avoid of multitude. Close quote. And he afterwards adds, quote, that this was in a transcendent manner understood by Paul, who was the leader both of him and his preceptor to divine illumination, close quote, in the above-cited verse, and, quote, that in divine natures, unions vanquish and precede separations, and yet, nevertheless, they are united after the separation which does not in proceeding depart from the one and is unical. Close quote. Paul, therefore, according to this Dionysius, considered the gods conformably to Plato and the best of his disciples as deiform processions from the one, and which at the same time that they have a distinct subsistence from, are profoundly united to their great producing cause. Dionysius also employs the very same expression which Proclus continually uses when speaking of the separation of the gods from their source. For he says that the divine multitude, anakvoitetas, to enos, irest, does not depart from, but abides in the one. Hence, Proclus, in the fifth book of his manuscript, Commentary on the Parmenides of Plato, speaking of the divine unities, says, quote, Whichever among these you assume, it is the same with the others, because all of them are in each other, and are rooted in the one. For as trees, by their summits, edest their roots, are fixed in the earth, and through these are earthly, after the same manner also divine natures are rooted by their summits in the one, and each of them is a unity and one, through unconfused union with the one itself. Close quote. Ingar an tuton labes, ten auten tais ales, lambanes dioti de passa kai en aleles esi, kai en eres don tai to eni. Kathaper gar ta dendra tais euton 
corathais in a druntai tege, kai esti gaina kat ekenas, tan elton tropon kai ta theatais elton acrotisin, in eristontai ta eni, kai ekaston elton enos esti, kaien dia ten prosta in asukton enosin. This Dionysius, who certainly lived posterior to Proclus, because he continually borrows from his works, barbarously confounding that scientific arrangement of these deiform processions from the one, which is so admirably unfolded by Proclus in the following work, classes them as follows. The first order, according to him, consists of seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. The second, of the divine essences characterized by dominion, might, and power. And the third, of principalities, archangels, and angels. Hence he has transferred the characteristics of the intelligible triad of gods to seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. For symmetry, truth, and beauty, which characterize this triad, are said by Plato in the Philebus to subsist in the vestibule of the good. Epimen tois tu agathu nun ede prothurois ephestanae. And Dionysius says of his first order that, quote, it is as it were arranged in the vestibules of deity. Close quote. Goodness, wisdom, and beauty also are shown by Proclus in the third book of the following work to belong to the intelligible triad. Goodness to its summit, wisdom to the middle of it, and beauty to its extremity. And Dionysius says, that according to the Hebrews, the word cherubim signifies a multitude of knowledge, or an effusion of wisdom. Ten de cherubim emphinen, plethos noseos, e cusin sophias. The characteristics of the gods, called noetos kai noeroi, intelligible and at the same time intellectual, and of the gods that are noeroi, intellectual alone. He appears to have transferred to this middle triad, which is characterized by dominion, might, and power. And he has adapted his third triad, consisting of principalities, archangels, and angels, to the supermundane liberated and mundane orders of gods. For the supermundane gods are called by Proclus in the sixth book of the following work, Archai, principalities, or rulers, which is the word employed by Dionysius and Paul. And the mundane gods are said by Proclus in Parmenides to be the sources of a winged life, and angels are celebrated by Dionysius as having wings. Hence it is evident that Dionysius has accommodated the peculiarities of the different orders of gods to the nine orders which he denominates celestial powers, and his arrangement has been adopted by all succeeding Christian theologists. End of part two of the introduction part three of the introduction to platonic theology by proclus translated by thomas taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain Vestiges, therefore, of the theology of Plato may be seen both in the Jewish and Christian religion, and in a similar manner 
a resemblance in the religions of all other nations to it might be easily pointed out, and its universality be clearly demonstrated. Omitting, however, a discussion of this kind for the present, I shall farther observe respecting this theology that the deification of dead men and the worshipping men as gods form no part of it when it is considered according to its genuine purity. Numerous instances of the truth of this might be adduced, but I shall mention for this purpose as unexceptional witnesses the writings of Plato, the golden Pythagoric verses, and the treatise of Plutarch on Isis and Osiris. All the works of Plato, indeed, evince the truth of this position, but this is particularly manifest from his laws. The golden verses order that the immortal gods be honored first, as they are disposed by law. Afterwards the illustrious heroes, under which appellation the author of the verses comprehends also angels and demons, properly so called, and in the last place the terrestrial demons, edest, such good men as transcend in virtue the rest of mankind. But to honor the gods, as they are disposed by law, is, as Heracles observes, to reverence them as they are arranged by their fabricator and father, and this is to honor them as beings superior to man. Hence, to honor men, however excellent they may be as gods, is not to honor the gods according to the rank in which they are placed by their creator. For it is confounding the divine with the human nature, and is thus acting directly contrary to the Pythagoric precept. Plutarch, too, in his above-mentioned treatise, most forcibly and clearly shows the impiety of worshipping men as gods, as is evident from the following extract. Quote, Those, therefore, who think that things of this kind, edest, fabulous stories of the gods, as if they were men, are but so many commemorations of the actions and disasters of kings and tyrants, who through transcendency in virtue or power inscribed the title of divinity on their renown, and afterwards fell into great calamities and misfortunes. These employ the most easy method indeed of eluding the story, and not badly transfer things of evil report from the gods to men, and they are assisted in so doing by the narrations themselves. For the Egyptians relate that Hermes was, as to his body, with one arm longer than the other, that Typhon was in his complexion red, but Orus white, and Osiris black, as if they had been by nature men. Farther still, they also call Osiris a commander, and Canopus a pilot, from whom they say the star of that name was denominated. The ship likewise, which the Greeks call Argo, being the image of the Ark of Osiris, and which therefore in honor of it is become a constellation, they make to ride not far from Orion and the dog, of which they consider the one as sacred to Orus, but the other to Isis. Quote, I fear, however, that this, according to the proverb, would be to move things immovable, and to declare war not only, as Simonides says, against a great length of time, but also against many nations and families of mankind, who are under the influence of divine inspiration through piety to these gods, and would not in any respect fall short of transferring from heaven to earth such great and venerable names, and of thereby shaking and dissolving that worship and belief 
which has been implanted in almost all men from their very birth, would be opening great doors to the tribe of atheists, who convert divine into human concerns, and would likewise afford a large license to the impostures of Euemerus of Messina, who devised certain memoirs of an incredible and fictitious mythology, and thereby spread every kind of atheism through the globe, by inscribing all the received gods, without any discrimination, by the names of generals, naval captains and kings, who lived in remote periods of time. He further adds that they are recorded in golden characters in a certain country called Pancoa, at which neither any barbarian or Grecian ever arrived, except Euemerus alone, who, as it seems, sailed to the Pancoans and Trifolians, that neither have nor ever had a being. And though the great actions of Samiramis are celebrated by the Assyrians, and those of Sesostris in Egypt, and though the Phrygians, even to the present time, call all splendid and admirable actions manic, because a certain person named Manus, who was one of their ancient kings, whom some call Mastus, was a brave and powerful man, and farther still, though Cyrus among the Persians, and Alexander among the Macedonians, proceeded in their victories almost as far as to the boundaries of the earth, yet they only retain the name of good kings, and are remembered as such, and not as gods. Quote, but if certain persons, inflated by ostentation, as Plato says, having their soul at one and the same time inflamed with youth and ignorance, have insolently assumed the appellation of gods, and had temples erected in their honour, yet this opinion of them flourished but for a short time, and afterwards they were charged with vanity and arrogance, in conjunction with impiety and lawless conduct, and thus like smoke, they flew away with swift-paced feet. And, being dragged from temples and altars like fugitive slaves, they have now nothing left them but their monuments and tombs. Hence Antigonus the elder said to one Hermodotus, who had celebrated him in his poems, as the offspring of the sun and a god, quote, he who empties my close stool-pan knows no such thing of me." Close quote. Very properly also did Lysippus the sculptor blame Apelles the painter for drawing the picture of Alexander with a thunderbolt in his hand, whereas he had represented him with a spear, the glory of which, as being true and proper, no time would take away. Close quote. In another part of the same work also, he admirably reprobates the impiety of making the gods to be things inanimate, which was very common with Latin writers of the Augustan age, and of the ages that accompanied the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But what he says on this subject is as follows. Quote, in the second place, which is of still greater consequence, men should be careful and very much afraid, lest, before they are aware, they tear in pieces and dissolve divine natures into blasts of wind, streams of water, seminations, earrings of land, accidents of the earth, and mutations of the seasons, as those do who make Bacchus to be wine, and Vulcan flame. Cleanthes also somewhere says that Persephone, or Proserpine, is the spirit or air that passes through, Phenomenon, the fruits of the earth, and is then slain, Phoneunomenon, and 
a certain poet says of reapers then when the youth the limbs of ceres cut for these men do not in any respect differ from those who conceive the sails the cables and the anchor of a ship to be the pilot the yarn and the web to be the weaver and the bowl or the mead or the tizen to be the physician but they also produce dire and atheistical opinions by giving the names of gods to natures and things deprived of sense and soul and that are necessarily destroyed by men who are in want of and use them for it is not possible to conceive that these things are gods since neither can anything be a god to men which is deprived of soul or is subject to human power from these things however we are led to conceive those beings to be gods who both use them and impart them to us and supply them perpetually and without ceasing nor do we conceive that the gods who bestow these are different in different countries nor that some of them are peculiar to the barbarians but others to the grecians nor that some are southern and others northern but as the sun and moon the heavens the land and the sea are common to all men yet are differently denominated by different nations so the one reason that adorns these things and the one providence that administers them and the ministrant powers that preside over all nations have different appellations and honors assigned them according to law by different countries of those also that have been consecrated to their service some employ obscure but others clearer symbols not without danger thus conducting our intellectual conceptions to the apprehension of divine natures for some deviating from the true meaning of these symbols have entirely slipped into superstition and others again flying from superstition as a quagmire have unaware fallen upon atheism as on a precipice hence in order to avoid these dangers it is especially necessary that resuming the reasoning of philosophy as our guide to mystic knowledge we should conceive piously of everything that is said or done in religion lest that as theodorus said while he extended his arguments with his right hand some of his auditors received them with their left so we should fall into dangerous errors by receiving what the laws have well instituted about sacrifices and festivals in a manner different from their original intention the emperor julian as well as plutarch appears to have been perfectly aware of this confusion in the religion of the heathens arising from the deification of men and in the fragments of his treatise against the christians preserved by cyril he speaks of it as follows quote, if any one wishes to consider the truth respecting you christians he will find that your impiety is composed of the judaic audacity and the indolence and confusion of the heathens for deriving from both not that which is most beautiful but the worst you have fabricated a web of evils with the hebrews indeed there are accurate and venerable laws pertaining to religion and innumerable precepts which require a most holy life and deliberate choice but when the jewish legislator forbids the serving all the gods and enjoins the worship of one alone whose portion is jacob and israel the line of his inheritance and not only says this but also omits to add i think you shall not revile the gods 
the detestable wickedness and audacity of those in after times, wishing to take away all religious reverence from the multitude, thought that not to worship should be followed by blaspheming the gods. This you have alone thence derived, but there is no similitude in anything else between you and them. Hence, from the innovation of the Hebrews, you have seized blasphemy towards the venerable gods. But from our religion, you have cast aside reverence to every nature more excellent than man, and the love of paternal institutes. Close quote. Quote, so great an apprehension indeed, says Dr. Stillingfleet, had the heathens of the necessity of appropriate acts of divine worship, that some of them have chosen to die, rather than to give them to what they did not believe to be God. We have a remarkable story to this purpose in Arian and Curtius, concerning Callisthenes. Alexander, arriving at that degree of vanity, as to desire to have divine worship given him, and the matter being started out of design among the courtiers, either by Anaxarchus as Arian, or Cleo the Sicilian, as Curtius says, and the way of doing it proposed, we dedicate by incense and prostration, Callisthenes vehemently opposed it, as that which would confound the difference of human and divine worship, which had been preserved inviolable among them. The worship of the gods had been kept up in temples, with altars and images, and sacrifices and hymns, and prostrations and such like. But it is by no means fitting, says he, for us to confound these things, either by lifting up men to the honours of the gods, or depressing the gods to the honours of men. For neither would Alexander suffer any man to usurp his royal dignity by the votes of men. How much more justly may the gods disdain for any man to take their honours to himself? And it appears by Plutarch, that the Greeks thought it a mean and base thing for any of them, when sent on an embassy to the kings of Persia, to prostrate themselves before them, because this was only allowed among them in divine adoration. Therefore, says he, when Pelopidas and Ismenias were sent to Artaxerxes, Pelopidas did nothing unworthy but Ismenias let fall his ring to the ground, and stooping for that was thought to make his adoration, which was altogether as good a shift as the Jesuits advising the crucifix to be held in the mandarin's hands while they made their adorations in the heathen temples in China. Quote, Conan also refused to make his adoration as a disgrace to his city, and Isocrates accuses the Persians for doing it, because herein they showed that they despised the gods rather than men, by prostituting their honours to their princes. Herodotus mentions Spercius and Bullius, who could not, with the greatest violence, be brought to give adoration to Xerxes, because it was against the law of their country to give divine honour to men. And Valerius Maximus says the Athenians put Timagoras to death for doing it. So strong an apprehension had possessed them, that the manner of worship which they used to their gods should be preserved sacred and inviolable. Close quote. The philosopher Sallust also, in his treatise On the Gods and the World, says, quote, 
it is not unreasonable to suppose that impiety is a species of punishment and that those who have had a knowledge of the gods and yet despised them will in another life be deprived of this knowledge and it is requisite to make the punishment of those who have honored their kings as gods to consist in being expelled from the gods Close quote when the ineffable transcendency of the first god which was considered as the grand principle in the heathen theology by its most ancient promulgators orpheus pythagoras and plato was forgotten this oblivion was doubtless the principal cause of dead men being deified by the pagans Hand they properly directed their attention to this transcendency they would have perceived it to be so immense as to surpass eternity infinity self-subsistence and even essence itself and that these in reality belong to those venerable natures which are as it were first unfolded into light from the unfathomable depths of that truly mystic unknown about which all knowledge is refunded into ignorance for as simplicius justly observes quote, it is requisite that he who ascends to the principle of things should investigate whether it is possible there can be anything better than the supposed principle and if something more excellent is found the same inquiry should again be made respecting that till we arrive at the highest conceptions than which we have no longer any more venerable nor should we stop in our ascent till we find this to be the case for there is no occasion to fear that our progression will be through an unsubstantial void by conceiving something about the first principles which is greater and more transcendent than their nature for it is not possible for our conceptions to take such a mighty leap as to equal and much less to pass beyond the dignity of the first principles of things Close quote. he adds quote, this therefore is one and the best extension of the soul to the highest god and is as much as possible irreprehensible we derelicet to know firmly that by ascribing to him the most venerable excellencies we can conceive and the most holy and primary names and things we ascribe nothing to him which is suitable to his dignity it is sufficient however to procure our pardon for the attempt that we can attribute to him nothing superior if it is not possible therefore to form any ideas equal to the dignity of the immediate progeny of the ineffable it est, of the first principles of things how much less can our conceptions reach that thrice unknown darkness in the reverential language of the egyptians which is even beyond these had the heathens therefore considered as they ought this transcendency of the supreme god they would never have presumed to equalize the human with the divine nature and consequently would never have worshipped men as gods their theology however is not to be accused as the cause of this impiety but their forgetfulness of the sublimest of its dogmas and the confusion with which this oblivion was necessarily attended in the last place i wish to adduce a few respectable testimonies to prove that statues were not considered nor worshipped by any of the intelligent heathens as gods but as the resemblances of the gods as auxiliaries 
to the recollection of a divine nature, and the means of procuring its assistance and favor. For this purpose, I shall first present the reader with what the philosopher Sallust says concerning sacrifices and the honors which were paid to the divinities in his golden treatise on the gods and the world. Quote, the honors, says he, which we pay to the gods are performed for the sake of our advantage, and since the providence of the gods is everywhere extended, a certain habitude or fitness is all that is requisite in order to receive their beneficent communications. But all habitude is produced through imitation and similitude. Hence temples imitate the heavens, but altars the earth. Statues resemble life, and on this account they are similar to animals. Prayers imitate that which is intellectual, but characters superior in effable powers. Herbs and stones resemble matter, and animals which are sacrificed the irrational life of our souls. But from all these nothing happens to the gods beyond what they already possess. For what accession can be made to a divine nature? But a conjunction with our souls and the gods is by these means produced. Quote, I think, however, it will be proper to add a few things concerning sacrifices. And, in the first place, since we possess everything from the gods, and it is but just to offer the first fruits of gifts to the givers, hence of our possessions we offer the first fruits through consecrated gifts, of our bodies through ornaments, and of our life through sacrifices. Besides, without sacrifices, prayers are words only, but accompanied with sacrifices, they become animated words, the words indeed corroborating life, but life animating the words. Add, too, that the felicity of everything is its proper perfection, but the proper perfection of everything consists in a conjunction with its cause and on this account we pray that we may be conjoined with the gods. Since, therefore, life primarily subsists in the gods, and there is also a certain human life, but the latter desires to be united to the former, a medium is required, for natures much distant from each other cannot be conjoined without a medium, and it is necessary that the medium should be similar to the connected natures. Life, therefore, must necessarily be the medium of life, and hence men of the present day that are happy, and all the ancients, have sacrificed animals, and this indeed not rashly, but in a manner accommodated to every god, with many other ceremonies respecting the cultivation of divinity. Close quote. In the next place, the elegant Maximus Turius admirably observes concerning the worship of statues as follows. Quote, it appears to me that as external discourse has no need, in order to its composition of certain Phoenician or Ionian or Attic or Assyrian, or Egyptian characters, but human imbecility devised these marks, in which, inserting its dullness, it recovers from them its memory. In like manner, a divine nature has no need of statues or altars, but human nature, being very imbecile, and as much distant from divinity as earth from heaven, devised these symbols in which it inserted the names and the renown of the gods. Those, therefore, whose memory is robust, 
and who are able by directly extending their soul to heaven to meet with divinity have perhaps no need of statues this race is however rare among men and in a whole nation you will not find one who recollects divinity and who is not in want of this kind of assistance which resembles that devised by writing masters for boys who give them obscure marks as copies by writing over which their hand being guided by that of the master they become through memory accustomed to the art it appears to me therefore that legislators devised these statues for men as if for a certain kind of boys as tokens of the honour which should be paid to divinity and a certain manuduction as it were and path to reminiscence Quote, of statues however there is neither one law nor one mode nor one art nor one matter for the greeks think it fit to honour the gods from things the most beautiful in the earth from a pure matter the human form and accurate art and their opinion is not irrational who fashion statues in the human resemblance for if the human soul is most near and most similar to divinity it is not reasonable to suppose that divinity would invest that which is most similar to himself with a most deformed body but rather with one which would be an easy vehicle to immortal souls light and adapted to motion for this alone of all the bodies on the earth raises its summit on high is magnificent superb and full of symmetry neither astonishing through its magnitude nor terrible through its strength nor moved with difficulty through its weight nor slippery through its smoothness nor repercussive through its hardness nor grovelling through its coldness nor precipitate through its heat nor inclined to swim through its laxity nor feeding on raw flesh through its ferocity nor on grass through its imbecility but is harmonically composed for its proper works and is dreadful to timid animals but mild to such as are brave it is also adapted to walk by nature but winged by reason capable of swimming by art feeds on corn and fruits and cultivates the earth is of a good colour stands firm has a pleasing countenance and a graceful beard in the resemblance of such a body the greeks think fit to honour the gods Close quote. he then observes quote, that with respect to the barbarians all of them in like manner admit the subsistence of divinity but different nations among these adopt different symbols Close quote. after which he adds o oh, many and all various statues of which some are fashioned by art and others are embraced through indigence some are honoured through utility and others are venerated through the astonishment which they excite some are considered as divine through their magnitude and others are celebrated for their beauty there is not indeed any race of men neither barbarian nor grecian neither maritime nor continental neither living a pastoral life nor dwelling in cities which can endure to be without some symbols of the honour of the gods how therefore shall any one discuss the question whether it is proper that statues of the gods should be fabricated or not for if we were to give laws to other men 
recently sprung from the earth, and dwelling beyond our boundaries and our air, or who were fashioned by a certain Prometheus, ignorant of life and law and reason, it might perhaps demand consideration whether this race should be permitted to adore these spontaneous statues alone, which are not fashioned from ivory or gold, and which are neither oaks nor cedars, nor rivers, nor birds, but the rising sun, the splendid moon, the variegated heaven, the earth itself and the air, all fire and all water. Or shall we constrain these men also to the necessity of honouring wood, or stones or images? If, however, this is the common law of all men, let us make no innovations. Let us admit the conceptions concerning the gods, and preserve their symbols as well as their names. Quote, For divinity indeed, the father and fabricator of all things, is more ancient than the sun and the heavens, more excellent than time and eternity, and every flowing nature, and is a legislator without law, ineffable by voice, and invisible by the eyes. Not being able, however, to comprehend his essence, we apply for assistance to words and names, to animals and figures of gold and ivory and silver, to plants and rivers, to the summits of mountains and to streams of water, desiring indeed to understand his nature but through imbecility calling him by the names of such things as appear to us to be beautiful. And in thus acting, we are affected in the same manner as lovers who are delighted with surveying the images of the objects of their love, and with recollecting the lyre, the dart, and the seed of these, the circus in which they ran, and everything, in short, which excites the memory of the beloved object. What then remains for me to investigate and determine respecting statues, only to admit the subsistence of deity? But if the art of Phidias excites the Greeks to the recollection of divinity, honour to animals the Egyptians, a river others, and fire others, I do not condemn the dissonance. Let them only know, let them only love, let them only be mindful of the object they adore. Close quote. With respect to the worship of animals, Plutarch apologizes for it in the following excellent manner in his treatise on Isis and Osiris. Quote, it now remains that we should speak of the utility of these animals to man, and of their symbolic meaning, some of them partaking of one of these only, but many of them of both. It is evident, therefore, that the Egyptians worshipped the ox, the sheep, and the ichneumon, on account of their use and benefit, as the Lemnians did larks for discovering the eggs of caterpillars and breaking them, and the Thessalian storks, because, as their land produced abundance of serpents, the storks destroyed all of them as soon as they appeared. Hence also they enacted a law, that whoever killed a stork should be banished. But the Egyptians honoured the asp, the weasel, and the beetle, in consequence of observing in them certain dark resemblances of the power of the gods, like that of the sun in drops of water. For at present many believe and assert that the weasel engenders by the ear and brings forth by the mouth, being thus an image of the generation of reason, or the productive principle of things 
but the genus of beetles has no female and all the males emit their sperm into a spherical piece of earth which they roll about thrusting it backwards with their hind feet while they themselves move forward just as the sun appears to revolve in a direction contrary to that of the heavens in consequence of moving from west to east they also assimilated the asp to a star as being exempt from old age and performing its motions unassisted by organs with agility and ease nor was the crocodile honoured by them without a probable cause but is said to have been considered by them as a resemblance of divinity as being the only animal that is without a tongue for the divine reason is unindigent of voice and proceeding through a silent path and accompanied with justice conducts mortal affairs according to it they also say it is the only animal living in water that has the sight of its eyes covered with a thin and transparent film which descends from his forehead so that he sees without being seen which is likewise the case with the first god but in whatever place the female crocodile may lay her eggs this may with certainty be concluded to be the boundary of the increase of the nile for not being able to lay their eggs in the water and fearing to lay them far from it they have such an accurate pre-sensation of futurity that though they enjoy the benefit of the river in its access during the time of their laying and hatching yet they preserve their eggs dry and untouched by the water they also lay sixty eggs are the same number of days in hatching them and those that are the longest lived among them live just so many years which number is the first of the measures employed by those who are conversant with the heavenly bodies Quote, moreover of those animals that were honoured for both reasons we have before spoken of the dog but the ibis killing indeed all deadly reptiles was the first that taught men the use of medical evacuation in consequence of observing that she is after this manner washed and purified by herself those priests also that are most attentive to the laws of sacred rites when they consecrate water for lustration fetch it from that place where the ibis had been drinking for she will neither drink nor come near unwholesome or infected water but with the distance of her feet from each other and her bill she makes an equilateral triangle farther still the variety and mixture of her black wings about the white represents the moon when she is gibbous Quote, we ought not however to wonder if the egyptians love such slender similitudes since the greeks also both in their pictures and statues employ many such like resemblances of the gods thus in crete there was a statue of jupiter without ears for it is fit that he who is the ruler and lord of all things should hear no one phidias also placed a dragon by the statue of minerva and a snail by that of venus at elis to show that virgins require a guard and that keeping at home and silence become married women but the trident of neptune is a symbol of the third region of the world which the sea possesses having an arrangement after the heavens and the air hence also they thus denominated amphitrite and the tritons the pythagoreans likewise adorned numbers and figures 
with the appellations of the gods for they called the equilateral triangle minerva corophagonus or begotten from the summit and tritogenea because it is divided by three perpendiculars drawn from the three angles but they called the one apollo being persuaded to this by the obvious meaning of the word apollo which signifies a privation of multitude and by the simplicity of the monad the duad they denominated strife and audacity and the triad justice for since injuring and being injured are two extremes subsisting according to excess and defect justice through equality has a situation in the middle but what is called the tetractus being the number thirty-six was as is reported their greatest oath and was denominated the world for this number is formed from the composition of the four first even and the four first odd numbers collected into one sum if therefore the most approved of the philosophers did not think it proper to neglect or despise any occult signification of a divine nature when they perceived it even in things which are inanimate and incorporeal it appears to me that they in a still greater degree venerated those peculiarities depending on manners which they saw in such natures as had sense and were endued with soul with passion and ethical habits we must embrace therefore not those who honour these kings but those who reverence divinity through these as through most clear mirrors and which are produced by nature in a becoming manner conceiving them to be the instruments or the art of the god by whom all things are perpetually adorned but we ought to think that no inanimate being can be more excellent than one that is animated nor an insensible than a sensitive being not even though some one should collect together all the gold and emeralds in the universe for the divinity is not ingenerated either in colours or figures or smoothness but such things as neither ever did nor are naturally adapted to participate of life have an allotment more ignoble than that of dead bodies but the nature which lives and sees and has the principle of motion from itself and a knowledge of things appropriate and foreign to its being has certainly derived an efflux and portion of that wisdom which as heraclitus says considers how both itself and the universe is governed hence the divinity is not worse represented in these animals than in the workmanships of copper and stone which in a similar manner suffer corruption and decay but are naturally deprived of all sense and consciousness this then i consider as the best defence that can be given of the adoration of animals by the egyptians with respect however to the sacred vestments those of isis are of various hues for her power is about matter which becomes and receives all things as light and darkness day and night fire and water life and death beginning and end but those of osiris are without a shade and have no variety of colours but have one only which is simple and luciform hence when the latter have been once used they are laid aside and preserved for the intelligible is invisible and intangible but the vestments of isis are used frequently 
for sensible things being in daily use and at hand present us with many developments and views of their different mutations but the intellectual perception of that which is intelligible genuine and holy luminously darting through the soul like a coruscation is attended with a simultaneous contact and vision of its object hence plato and aristotle call this part of philosophy epoptic or intuitive indicating that those who have through the exercise of the reasoning power soared beyond these doxastic mingled and all various natures raise themselves to that first simple and immaterial principle and passing into contact with the pure truth which subsists about it they consider themselves as having at length obtained the end of philosophy and that which the present devoted and veiled priests obscurely manifest with great reverence and caution is that this god is the ruler and prince of the dead and is not different from that divinity who is called by the greeks hades and pluto the truth of which assertion not being understood disturbs the multitude who suspect that the truly sacred and holy osiris dwells in and under the earth where the bodies of those are concealed who appear to have obtained an end of their being but he indeed himself is at the remotest distance from the earth unstained unpolluted and pure from every essence that receives corruption and death the souls of men however being here encompassed with bodies and passions cannot participate of divinity except as of an obscure dream by intellectual contact through philosophy but when they are liberated from the body and pass into the invisible impassive and pure region this god is then their leader and king from whom they depend insatiably beholding him and desiring to survey that beauty which cannot be expressed or uttered by men and which isis as the ancient discourse evinces always loving pursuing and enjoying fills such things in these lower regions as participate of generation with everything beautiful and good Close quote. and lastly the emperor julian in a fragment of an oration or epistle on the duties of a priest has the following remarks on religiously venerating statues quote, statues and altars and the preservation of unextinguished fire and in short all such particulars have been established by our fathers as symbols of the presence of the gods not that we should believe that these symbols are gods but that through these we should worship the gods for since we are connected with body it is also necessary that our worship of the gods should be performed in a corporeal manner but they are incorporeal and they indeed have exhibited to us as the first of statues that which ranks as the second genus of gods from the first and which circularly revolves round the whole of heaven since however a corporeal worship cannot even be paid to these because they are naturally unindigent a third kind of statues was devised on the earth by the worship of which we render the gods propitious to us for as those who reverence the images of kings who are not in want of any such reverence at the same time attract to themselves their benevolence thus also those who venerate the statues of the gods who are not in want of anything 
persuade the gods by this veneration to assist and be favorable to them for alacrity in the performance of things in our power is a document of true sanctity and it is very evident that he who accomplishes the former will in a greater degree possess the latter but he who despises things in his power and afterwards pretends to desire impossibilities evidently does not pursue the latter and overlooks the former for though divinity is not in want of anything it does not follow that on this account nothing is to be offered to him for neither is he in want of celebration through the ministry of words what then is it therefore reasonable that he should be deprived of this by no means neither therefore is he to be deprived of the honor which is paid him through works which honor has been legally established not for three or for three thousand years but in all preceding ages among all nations of the earth Quote, but the galileans will say o oh, you who have admitted into your soul every multitude of demons whom though according to you they are formless and unfigured you have fashioned in a corporeal resemblance it is not fit that honor should be paid to divinity through such works how then do not we heathens consider as wood and stones those statues which are fashioned by the hands of men o oh, more stupid than even stones themselves do you fancy that all men are to be drawn by the nose as you are drawn by execrable demons so as to think that the artificial resemblances of the gods are the gods themselves looking therefore to the resemblances of the gods we do not think them to be either stones or wood for neither do we think that the gods are these resemblances since neither do we say that royal images are wood or stone or brass nor that they are the kings themselves but the images of kings whoever therefore loves his king beholds with pleasure the image of his king whoever loves his child is delighted with his image and whoever loves his father surveys his image with delight hence also he who is a lover of divinity gladly surveys the statues and images of the gods at the same time venerating and fearing with a holy dread the gods who invisibly behold him end of part three of the introduction part four of the introduction to platonic theology by proclus translated by thomas taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain the catholics have employed arguments similar to these in defense of the reverence which they pay to the images of their saints indeed it is the doctrine of the church of england that the catholics form the same opinions of the saints whose images they worship as the heathens did of their gods and employ the same outward rites in honoring their images as the heathens did in the religious veneration of their statues thus as the heathens had their tutelar gods such as were belus to the babylonians and assyrians osiris and isis to the egyptians and vulcan to the lemnians thus also the catholics attribute the defense of certain countries to certain saints have not the saints also to whom the safeguard of particular cities is committed 
the same office as the de praesides of the heathens such as were at delphi apollo at athens minerva at carthage juno and at rome quirinus and do not the saints to whom churches are built and altars erected correspond to the de patroni of the heathens such as were in the capital jupiter in the temple at paphos venus in the temple of ephesus diana are not likewise our lady of walsingham our lady of ipswich our lady of wilston and the like imitations of diana agratera diana corypheia diana ephesia venus cypria venus paphia venus nydia and the like the catholics too have substituted for the marine deities neptune triton nereus castor and pollux venus etc saint christopher saint clement and others and especially our lady as she is called by them to whom seamen sing ave marius stella neither has the fire escaped their imitation of the pagans for instead of vulcan and vesta the inspective guardians of fire according to the heathens the catholics have substituted saint agatha on the day of whose nativity they make letters for the purpose of extinguishing fire every artificer likewise and profession has a special saint in the place of a presiding god thus scholars have saint nicholas and saint gregory painters saint luke nor are soldiers in want of a saint corresponding to mars nor lovers of one who is a substitute for venus all diseases too have their special saints instead of gods who are invoked as possessing a healing power thus the venereal disease has saint rock the falling sickness saint cornelius the toothache saint apollin etc beasts and cattle also have their presiding saints for saint loi says the homily is the horse leech and saint antony the swineherd etc the homily adds quote, that in many points the papists exceed the gentiles in idolatry and particularly in honoring and worshiping the relics and bones of saints which prove that they be mortal men and dead and therefore no gods to be worshipped which the gentiles would never confess of their gods for very shame and after enumerating many ridiculous practices of the catholics in reference to these relics the homily concludes with observing that they are not only more wicked than the gentile idolaters but also no wiser than asses horses and mules which have no understanding in the second place the homilies show that the rites and ceremonies of the papists in honouring and worshipping their images or saints are the same with the rites of the pagans this say they is evident in their pilgrimages to visit images which had more holiness and virtue in them than others in their candle religion burning incense offering up gold to images hanging up crutches chairs and ships legs arms and whole men and women of war before images as though by them or saints as they say they were delivered from lameness 
sickness, captivity, or shipwreck. Close quote. In spreading abroad after the manner of the heathens, the miracles that have accompanied images, quote, such an image was sent from heaven like the Palladium or Diana of the Ephesians. Such an image was brought by angels. Such a one came itself far from the east to the west, as Dame Fortune fled to Rome. Some images, though they were hard and stony, yet for tender heart and pity wept. Some spake more monstrously than ever did Balaam's ass, who had life and breath in him. Such a cripple came and saluted this saint of oak, and by and by he was made whole, and here hangeth his crutch. Such a one in a tempest vowed to St. Christopher and escaped, and behold, here is his ship of war. Such a one, by St. Leonard's help, break out of prison, and see where his fetters hang. And infinite thousands more miracles by like, or more shameless lies, were reported. Close quote. After all this, I appeal to every intelligent reader, whether the religion of the heathens, according to its genuine purity, as delineated in this introduction, and as professed and promulgated by the best and wisest men of antiquity, is not infinitely preferable to that of the Catholics, and whether it is not more holy to reverence beings the immediate progeny of the ineffable principle of all things, and which are eternally centered and rooted in him, and to believe that in reverencing these we at the same time reverence the ineffable, because they partake of his nature, and that through these, as media, we become united with him, then to reverence men and the images of men, many of whom when living were the disgrace of human nature. The Church of England, as we see, prefers the pagans to the papists, and I trust that every other sect of Protestant Christians will unanimously subscribe to her decision, and thus much in defense of the theology of Plato and the religious worship of the heathens. It now remains that I should speak of the following work, of its author and the translation. The work itself, then, is a scientific development of the deiform processions from the ineffable principle of things, and this, as it appears to me, in the greatest perfection possible to man. For the reasoning is everywhere consummately accurate and deduced from self-evident principles, and the conclusions are the result of what Plato powerfully calls geometrical necessities. To the reader of this work, indeed, who has not been properly disciplined in Eleatic and academic studies, and who has not a genius naturally adapted to such abstruse speculations, it will doubtless appear to be perfectly unintelligible, and, in the language of critical Kant, nothing but jargon and reverie. This, however, is what Plato, the great hierophant of this theology, predicted would be the case, if ever it was unfolded to the multitude at large. Quote, For as it appears to me, says he, there are scarcely any particulars which will be considered by the multitude more ridiculous than these, nor again any which will appear more wonderful and enthusiastic to those who are naturally adapted to perceive them. Close quote. In his seventh epistle also he observes as follows, quote, Thus much, however, 
I shall say respecting all those who either have written or shall write, affirming that they know those things which are the objects of my study, whether they have heard them from me or from others, or whether they have discovered them themselves, that they have not heard anything about these things conformable to my opinion. For I never have written nor ever shall write about them. For a thing of this kind cannot be expressed by words like other disciplines, but by long familiarity and living in conjunction with the thing itself. A light, as it were, leaping from a fire, will on a sudden be enkindled in the soul, and there itself nourish itself. Close quote. And shortly after he adds, quote, But if it appeared to me that the particulars of which I am speaking could be sufficiently communicated to the multitude by writing or speech, what could we accomplish more beautiful in life than to impart a mighty benefit to mankind, and lead an intelligible nature into light, so as to be obvious to all men? I think, however, that an attempt of this kind would only be beneficial to a few, who, from some small vestiges previously demonstrated, are themselves able to discover these abstruse particulars. But, with respect to the rest of mankind, some it will fill with a contempt by no means elegant, and others with a lofty and arrogant hope that they shall now learn certain venerable things. Close quote. The prediction of Plato, therefore, has been but too truly fulfilled in the faint which has attended the writings of the best of his disciples, among whom Proclus certainly maintains the most distinguished rank. This indeed, these disciples well knew would be the case, but perceiving that the hand of barbaric and despotic power was about to destroy the schools of the philosophers, and foreseeing that dreadful night of ignorance and folly which succeeded so nefarious an undertaking, they benevolently disclosed in as luminous a manner as the subject would permit the arcana of their master's doctrines, thereby, as Plato expresses it, giving assistance to philosophy, and also preserving it as a paternal and immortal inheritance to the latest posterity. Proclus, in the first book of this work, has enumerated the requisites which a student of it ought to possess, and it is most certain that he who does not possess them will never fathom the depths of this theology, or perceive his mind irradiated with that admirable light, mentioned by Plato in the foregoing extract, and which is only to be seen by that eye of the soul, which is better worth saving than ten thousand corporeal eyes. With respect to the diction of Proclus in this work, its general character is that of purity, clearness, copiousness, and magnificence, so that even the fastidious critic who considers every Greek writer as partially barbarous who lived after the fall of the Macedonian Empire, must, however unwillingly, be forced to acknowledge that Proclus is a splendid exception. The sagacious Kepler, whose decision on this subject outweighs in my opinion that of a swarm of modern critics, after having made a long extract from the commentaries of Proclus on Euclid, gives the following animated encomium of his diction. Quote, Oratio fluit ipsi torrentis instar, ripas inundans, et coica dubitationum vada 
Gurgitesque ocutans. Du mens plena maestatis tantarum rerum. Luctator in angustis linguae. Et conclusio nunquam sibi ipsi verborum copia satisfaciens. Propositionum simplicitatem excedit. Close quote. Id est, quote, his language flows like a torrent, inundating its banks, and hiding the dark fords and whirlpools of doubt, while his mind, full of the majesty of things of such a magnitude, struggles in the straits of language, and the conclusion never satisfying him exceeds by the copia of words the simplicity of the propositions. Close quote. If we omit what Kepler here says about the struggle of the mind of Proclus, and his never being satisfied with the conclusion, the rest of his eulogy is equally applicable to the style of the present work, so far as it is possible for the beauties of diction to be combined with the rigid accuracy of geometrical reasoning. With respect to the life of Proclus, it has been written with great elegance by his disciple Marinus, and a translation of it by me prefixed to my version of the Commentaries of Proclus was published in 1788. From the edition of that life, therefore, by Fabricius, the following particulars relative to this very extraordinary man are extracted, for the information of the reader who may not have the translation of it in his possession. According to the accurate chronology then of Fabricius, Proclus was born at Byzantium in the year of Christ, 412, on the 6th of the Ides of February, and died in the 124th year after the reign of the Emperor Julian, on the 17th day of the Attic Munician, or the April of the Romans, Nicagoras the Junior being at that time the Athenian Archon. His father, Patricius, and his mother, Marcella, were both of them of the Lycian nation, and were no less illustrious for their virtue than their birth. As soon as he was born, his parents brought him to their native country, Xanthus, which was sacred to Apollo, and this, says Marinus, happened to him by a certain divine allotment. Quote, for, he adds, I think it was necessary that he, who was to be the leader of all sciences, should be nourished and educated under the presiding deity of the Muses. Close quote. The person of Proclus was uncommonly beautiful, and he not only possessed all the moral and intellectual virtues in the highest perfection, but the vestiges of them also, which are denominated the physical virtues, were clearly seen, says Marinus, in his last and shelly vestment the body. Hence he possessed a remarkable acuteness of sensation, and particularly in the most honourable of the senses, sight and hearing, which, as Plato says, were imparted by the gods to men for the purpose of philosophizing, and for the well-being of the animal life. In the second place, he possessed so great a strength of body that it was neither injured by cold, nor any endurance of labors, though these were extreme, both by night and day. In the third place, he was, as we have before observed, very beautiful. Quote, For not only, says Marinus, did his body possess great symmetry, but a living light, as it were, beaming from his soul, was efflorescent in his body, and shone forth with an admirable splendor, 
which it is impossible to describe. Close quote. Marinus adds, quote, Indeed, he was so beautiful that no painter could accurately exhibit his resemblance, and all the pictures of him which were circulated, though very beautiful, were very inferior to the beauty of the original. Close quote and in the fourth place he possessed health in such perfection that he was not ill above twice or thrice in the course of so long a life as seventy-five years such then were the corporeal prerogatives which proclus possessed and which may be called the forerunners of the forms of perfect virtue but he possessed in a wonderful manner what plato calls the elements of a philosophic genius for he had an excellent memory learned with facility was magnificent and graceful and the friend and ally of truth justice fortitude and temperance having for a short space of time applied himself in lycia to grammar he went to Alexandria in Egypt, and was there instructed in rhetoric by Leonus, who derived his lineage from Isaurus, and in grammar by Orion, whose ancestors discharged the sacerdotal office among the Egyptians, and who composed elaborate treatises on that art. A certain good fortune, however, says Marinus, brought him back to the place of his nativity, for on his return his tutelar goddess exhorted him to philosophy and to visit the Athenian schools. Having, therefore, first returned to Alexandria, and bade farewell to rhetoric, and the other arts which he had formerly studied, he gave himself up to the discourses of the philosophers then resident at Alexandria. Here he became an auditor of Olympiodorus, the most illustrious of philosophers, for the sake of imbibing the doctrine of Aristotle, and was instructed in the mathematical disciplines by Hera, a religious man and eminently skillful in teaching those sciences. Proclus, however, not being satisfied with the Alexandrian schools, went to Athens, quote, with a certain splendid procession, says Marinus, of all eloquence and elegance, and attended by the gods that preside over philosophy, and by beneficent demons. For that the succession of philosophy might be preserved legitimate and genuine, the gods led him to the city over which its inspective guardian presides. Close quote. Hence, Proclus was called Kat Exochen, by way of eminence, the Platonic successor. At Athens, therefore, Proclus fortunately met with the first of philosophers, Surianus, the son of Philoxenus, who not only much assisted him in his studies, but made him his domestic as to other concerns, and the companion of his philosophic life, having found him such an auditor and successor as he had a long time sought for, and one who was capable of receiving a multitude of disciplines and divine dogmas. In less than two whole years, therefore, Proclus read with Surianus all the works of Aristotle, Videlicet, his logic, ethics, politics, physics, and theological science, and, being sufficiently instructed in these, as in certain protelea, or things preparatory to initiation and lesser mysteries, Surianus led him to the mystic discipline of Plato in an orderly progression, and not according to the Chaldean oracle with a transcendent foot. He likewise enabled Proclus to survey in conjunction with him, says Marinus, truly divine mysteries, 
with the eyes of his soul free from material darkness and with undefiled intellectual vision but proclus employing sleepless exercise and attention both by night and by day and synoptically and judiciously committing to writing what he heard from surianus made so great a progress in a little time that by then he was twenty-eight years of age he had composed a multitude of works and among the rest his commentaries on the timaeus which are truly elegant and full of science but from such a discipline as this his manners became more adorned and as he advanced in science he increased in virtue marinus after this shows how proclus possessed all the virtues in the greatest possible perfection and how he proceeded from the exercise of the political virtues which are produced by reason adorning the irrational part as its instrument to the cathartic virtues which pertain to reason alone withdrawing from other things to itself throwing aside the instruments of sense as vain repressing also the energies through these instruments and liberating the soul from the bonds of generation he then adds quote, proclus having made a proficiency through these virtues as it were by certain mystic steps recurred from these to such as are greater and more telestic being conducted to them by a prosperous nature and scientific discipline for being now purified rising above generation and despising its thyrsus bearers he was agitated with a divinely inspired fury about the first essences and became an inspector of the truly blessed spectacles which they contain no longer collecting discursively and demonstratively the science of them but surveying them as it were by simple intuition and beholding through intellectual energies the paradigms in a divine intellect assuming a virtue which can no longer be denominated prudence but which ought rather to be called wisdom or something still more venerable than this the philosopher therefore energizing according to this virtue easily comprehended all the theology of the greeks and barbarians and that which is adumbrated in mythological fictions and brought it into light to those who are willing and able to understand it he explained likewise everything in a more enthusiastic manner and brought the different theologies to an harmonious agreement at the same time also investigating the writings of the ancients whatever he found in them genuine he judiciously adopted but if he found anything of a spurious nature this he entirely rejected as erroneous he also strenuously subverted by a diligent examination such doctrines as were contrary to truth in his associations too with others he employed no less force and perspicuity for he was a man laborious beyond measure as in one day he gave five and sometimes more lectures and wrote as many as seven hundred verses besides this he went to other philosophers and spent the evening in conversation with them and all these employments he executed in such a manner as not to neglect his nocturnal and vigilant piety to the gods and assiduously supplicating the sun when rising when at his meridian altitude and when he sets Close quote. marinus further observes of this most extraordinary man quote, 
that he did not seem to be without divine inspiration for words similar to the most white and thick falling snow proceeded from his wise mouth his eyes appeared to be filled with a fulgid splendour and the rest of his face to participate of divine illumination hence rufinus a man illustrious in the republic and who was also a man of veracity and in other respects venerable happening to be present with him when he was lecturing perceived that his head was surrounded with a light and when proclus had finished his lecture rufinus rising adored him and testified by an oath the truth of the divine vision which he had seen Close quote. marinus also informs us quote, that proclus being purified in an orderly manner by the chaldean purifications was an inspector of the lucid hecatic visions as he himself somewhere mentions in one of his writings by opportunely moving likewise a certain hecatic spirula he procured showers of rain and freed athens from an unseasonable heat besides this by certain phylacteria or charms he stopped an earthquake and had made trial of the divining energy of the tripod having been instructed by certain verses respecting its failure for when he was in his fortieth year he appeared in a dream to utter the following verses high above ether there with radiance bright a pure immortal splendor wings its flight whose beams divine with vivid force aspire and leap resounding from a fount of fire and in the beginning of his forty-second year he appeared to himself to pronounce with a loud voice these verses lo on my soul a sacred fire descends whose vivid power the intellect extends from whence far beaming through dull bodies night it soars to ether decked with starry light and with soft murmurs through the azure round the lucid regions of the gods resound besides he clearly perceived that he belonged to the mercurial series and was persuaded from a dream that he possessed the soul of nicomachus the pythagorean Close quote. in the last place marinus adds quote, that the lovers of more elegant studies may be able to conjecture from the position of the stars under which he was born that the condition of his life was by no means among the last or middle but among the first orders we have thought fit to expose in this place the following scheme of his nativity the sun at sixteen degrees twenty six minutes aquarius the moon at seventeen degrees twenty nine minutes gemini saturn at twenty four degrees twenty three minutes taurus jupiter at twenty four degrees forty one minutes taurus mars at twenty nine degrees fifty minutes sagittarius venus at zero degrees twenty three minutes pisces mercury at four degrees forty two minutes aquarius ascendant at eight degrees nineteen minutes aries mid heaven at four degrees forty two minutes capricorn south node or descending node or the head of the dragon at twenty four degrees thirty three minutes scorpio the new moon preceding his birth at eight degrees 
51 minutes, Aquarius. And thus much for the life of Proclus. With respect to the translation of the following work on the theology of Plato, I can only say that I have endeavored to render it as faithful as possible, and to preserve the manner as well as the matter of the author, this being indispensably necessary, both from the importance of the subject and the scientific accuracy of the reasoning with which it is discussed. I have added a seventh book in order to render the work complete, for without the development of the mundane gods and the more excellent genera, their perpetual attendants, it would obviously be incomplete. From the catalogue of the manuscripts in the late French king's library, it is evident that Proclus had written a seventh book, as some chapters of it are there said to be extant in that library. These I have endeavoured, but without success, to obtain. The want of this seventh book by Proclus will doubtless be considered by all the friends of Greek literature, and particularly by all who are lovers of the doctrines of Plato, as a loss of no common magnitude. It is, however, a fortunate circumstance that in the composition of the seventh book I have been able to supply the deficiency arising from the want of that which was written by Proclus, in a great measure, from other works of Proclus himself, and particularly from his very elegant and scientific commentaries on the Timaeus of Plato, so that I trust the loss is in some measure supplied, though I am sensible, very inadequately, could it be compared with the book which was written by a man of such gigantic powers of mind as Proclus, and who had also sources of information on the subject which at the present period it is impossible to obtain. A translation of the elements of theology is added in order to render the treatise on the theology of Plato more complete, and to assist the reader who wishes to penetrate the depths of that most abstruse and sublime work, for the former elucidates and is elucidated by the latter. In translating the treatise of Proclus on Providence and Fate, I had great difficulties to encounter, as the original Greek is lost, and nothing but a Latin translation, which Fabricius observes, is all but barbarous remains. If the reader compares that translation with mine, he will at once acknowledge the truth of my remark. Indeed, that translation is in some parts so barbarous that nothing but an intimate acquaintance with the writings of Proclus and the philosophy of Plato could enable any one to render them intelligible in another language. The same observation is partially applicable to the translation of the extracts from two other treatises of Proclus. The Greek text of Proclus abounds with errors, so that the emendations which I have made and the deficiencies which I have supplied in this volume amount to more than four hundred, and the Latin translation of Portus is so very faulty as to be almost beyond example bad. Having discovered this to be the case, and having in so many places corrected the original, I scarcely think that any of my critical enemies will be hardy enough to say that any part of this volume was translated from the Latin, where the Greek could be obtained. As I am conscious, however, that in what is now offered to the public I had no other view than to benefit those who are capable of being benefited by such sublime speculations, that wishing well to all mankind, and particularly to my country, I have labored to disseminate the philosophy and theology of Plato, 
as highly favorable to the interests of piety and good government, and most hostile to lawless conduct and revolutionary principles, and that I have done my best to deserve the esteem of the wise and worthy part of mankind, I am wholly unconcerned as to the reception it may meet with from the malevolent, though I wish for the approbation of the candid critics of the day. For in all my labors I have invariably observed the following Pythagoric precept. Quote, do those things which you judge to be beautiful, though in doing them you should be without renown, for the rabble is a bad judge of a good thing. Close quote. End of the introduction. Contents of the chapters of Platonic Theology by Proclus, translated by Thomas Taylor. Contents of the Chapters of Book One. Chapter One. The Preface, in which the scope of the treatise is unfolded, together with the praise of Plato himself and of those that received the philosophy from him. Chapter Two what the mode of the discussion is in the present treatise, and what preparation of the auditors of it is previously necessary. Chapter 3. What a theologist is according to Plato, whence he begins, as far as to what hypostases he ascends, and according to what power of the soul he particularly energizes. Chapter 4. The Theological Types or Forms, According to All Which Plato Disposes the Doctrine Concerning the Gods. Chapter 5. What the Dialogues Are, From Which the Theology of Plato May Especially Be Assumed, And To What Orders of Gods Each of These Dialogues Refers Us. Chapter 6. An Objection against collecting the Platonic theology from many dialogues, in consequence of its being partial and distributed into minute parts. Chapter 7. A solution of the before-mentioned objection, referring to one dialogue, the Parmenides, the whole truth concerning the gods according to Plato. Chapter 8. An enumeration of the different opinions concerning the Parmenides, and a division of the objections to them. Chapter 9. A confutation of those who assert that the Parmenides is a logical dialogue, and who admit that the discussion in it is argumentative, proceeding through subjects of opinion. Chapter 10. How far they are right to assert that the hypotheses of the Parmenides are concerning the principles of things, and what is to be added to what they say from the doctrine of our preceptor, Surianus. Chapter 11. Many demonstrations concerning the conclusions of the second hypothesis, and of the division of it according to the divine orders. Chapter 12. The intention of the hypotheses, demonstrating their connection with each other and their consent with the things themselves. Chapter 13. What the common rules concerning the gods are, which Plato delivers in the laws, and also concerning the hyparxis of the gods, their providence and their immutable perfection. Chapter 14. How the hyparxis of the gods is delivered in the laws, and through what media the discourse recurs to the truly existing gods. How the providence of the gods is demonstrated in the laws, and what the mode of their providence is according to Plato. 
Chapter 15. Through what arguments in the same treatise, the laws, it is demonstrated that the gods provide for all things immutably. Chapter 16. What the axioms are concerning the gods, which are delivered in the Republic, and what order they have with respect to each other. Chapter 17. What the goodness of the gods is, and how they are said to be the causes of all good, and that evil, according to every hypostasis, is itself adorned and arranged by the gods. Chapter 18. What the immutability is of the gods, where also it is shown what their self-sufficiency and firm impassivity are, and how we are to understand their possessing an invariable sameness of subsistence. Chapter 19. What the simplicity is of the gods, and how that which is simple in them appears to be various in secondary natures. Chapter 20. What the truth is in the gods, and whence falsehood is introduced in the participations of the gods by secondary natures. Chapter 21. From the axioms in the Phaedrus concerning everything divine, it follows that everything divine is beautiful, wise, and good. Chapter 22. A discussion of the dogmas concerning the goodness of the gods, and an investigation of the elements of the good in the Philebus. Chapter 23. What the wisdom of the gods is, and what elements of it may be assumed from Plato. Chapter 24. Concerning divine beauty and the elements of it as delivered by Plato. Chapter 25. What the triad is which is conjoined with the good, the wise, and the beautiful, and what auxiliaries to the theory of it Plato affords us. Chapter 26. Concerning the axioms delivered in the Phaedo respecting an invisible nature, what the divine nature is, what the immortal and the intelligible are, and what order these possess with reference to each other. Chapter 27. What the uniform and indissoluble are, and how sameness of subsistence and the unbegotten are to be assumed in divine natures. Chapter 28. How paternal and how maternal causes are to be assumed in the gods. Chapter 29. Concerning divine names, and the rectitude of them, as delivered in the Cratylus. Contents of the chapters of Book 2. Chapter 1. A method leading to the superessential principle of all things, according to the intellectual conception of the One and Multitude. Chapter 2. A second method unfolding the hypostasis of the One, and demonstrating it to be exempt from all corporeal and incorporeal essences. Chapter 3. Many arguments in confirmation of the same thing, and evincing the irreprehensible hypothesis of the One. Chapter 4. A confutation of those who say that the first principle is not according to Plato above intellect, and demonstrations from the Republic, the Sopista, the Philebus, and the Parmenides of the superessential hypostasis of the One. Chapter 5. What the modes are of ascent to the One according to Plato and that the modes are two through analogy and through negations. Likewise, where Plato treats of each of these, and through what cause. Chapter 6. By what and by how many names Plato unfolds the ineffable principle, 
and why he unfolds it by such and by so many names, and how these names accord with the modes of assent to it. Chapter 7. What the assertions are in the Republic concerning the first principle, through its analogy to the sun, where also it is shown how it is celebrated as the good, and as the most splendid of being, how the sun is the offspring of the good, and that according to each order of divine natures there is a monad analogous to the first principle, and how the first principle is the cause of all beings, and is itself prior to power and energy. Chapter 8 what Plato, in his epistle to Dionysius, says the first king is, and admonitions that the first god is discussed in that epistle. Chapter 9. What the three conceptions are which are delivered in that epistle concerning the first king, how all things are about him, how all things are for his sake, how he is the cause of all beautiful things, what the order is of these conceptions, and from what hypotheses they are assumed. Chapter 10. How, in the first hypothesis of the Parmenides, Plato delivers the doctrine concerning the One, employing for this purpose negations, and on what account the negations are such and so many. Chapter 11. How it is necessary to enter on the theory concerning the One through negations, and what disposition of the soul is most adapted to discussions of this kind. Chapter 12. A celebration of the One, demonstrating through negative conclusions that it is exempt from all the orders of beings, according to the order delivered in the Parmenides. Contents of the Chapters of Book 3 Chapter 1 That after the discussion in common of the one principle of things, it is requisite to treat of the divine orders, and to show how many they are, and how they are divided from each other. Chapter 2. That the multitude of unities, according to which the gods have their hypostasis, subsists after the one. Chapter 3. How many the particulars are, which ought to be demonstrated previous to the discovery of the multitude of the divine orders, and an uninterrupted narration of the doctrine of these. Chapter 4 that all the unities are participable, and that there is only one truly superessential one, but that all the other unities are participated by essences. Chapter 5. That the participations of the unities, which are nearer to the one, proceed into more simple hypostases, but the participations of those that are remote from the one proceed into more composite hypostases. Chapter 6. What the natures are which participate of the divine unities, and what the order of them is with respect to each other, and that being indeed is the most ancient of these, life the second, intellect the third, soul the fourth, and body the last, and that there are also as many orders of the divine unities. Chapter 7. A resumption of the doctrine concerning the One, and a discussion of the biformed principles posterior to the One. Chapter 8 what the two principles are of all things posterior to the one, how Socrates the Philebus calls them bound and infinity, 
and of what things they are the causes to beings. Chapter 9. What the third thing is which is produced from the two principles. Why Socrates in the Philebus calls it that which is mixed. That it is nothing else than that which is primarily being, and how this proceeds from the two principles and from the one. Chapter 10. How from images also it may be inferred that the first thing which subsists from bound and infinity is being. How this may be demonstrated, and how bound and infinity are twofold, one order of these subsisting in being, but the other existing prior to being. Chapter 11. What the triad is, which Socrates in the Philebus says is inherent in everything that is mixed. Chapter 12. Concerning the first intelligible triad in common, and how the second triad proceeds analogous to this. Chapter 13. What the second intelligible triad is. A more accurate account of it, as subsisting from that which predominates, from that which is participated, and from that which characterizes the mixture. Chapter 14. What the third intelligible triad is. What that is which predominates, and is participated in this, and at the end a discourse in common concerning the distinction of the three triads. Chapter 15. How the intelligible triads are delivered in the Timaeus, and many admonitions concerning animal itself, evincing that it has the third order in intelligibles. Chapter 16. Many demonstrations that eternity subsists according to the middle order of intelligibles. Chapter 17. That the one in which eternity abides is the summit of intelligibles. Chapter 18. Concerning all the intelligible orders in common, according to the doctrine of Timaeus, and a more accurate account of the peculiarities in the intelligible triads. Chapter 19. Concerning intelligible forms, and the doctrine unfolding the peculiarity of them, how likewise they are for, and from what causes they subsist. Chapter 20. That also, from what is said in the Sapista, it is possible to discover the three intelligible orders. We did a leak it, in that part of the Sapista, in which it is shown what the one being, what whole, and what all are. Chapter 21. A summary account of what has been said concerning the intelligible triads and admonitions from Plato that it is possible to divide them into father, power, and intellect. Chapter 22. How in the Phaedrus it is said that everything divine is beautiful, wise, and good. What triple elements of each of these Plato delivers, and how from these it is possible to accede to the union and separation of the intelligible triads. Chapter 23. How Parmenides delivers the multitude of gods in the second hypothesis, and how we should discourse about each order of them, employing for this purpose the conclusions of that hypothesis. Chapter 24. What the first intelligible triad is according to Parmenides, whence he begins, and how far he proceeds, teaching concerning it. Chapter 25. What the second intelligible triad is, how it is delivered by Parmenides in continuity with the triad prior to it, 
and how far he produces the discourse concerning it. Chapter 26. What the third intelligible triad is, and how Parmenides unfolds it through the third conclusion. Chapter 27. Concerning the three conclusions in common, through which the three orders of intelligibles are characterized, and how through these it is possible to dissolve the most difficult of theological doubts. Chapter 28. A Celebration of the Intelligible Gods, Unfolding at the Same Time the Union of Intelligibles Themselves with the Good and Their Exempt Hyparxis. Contents of the Chapters of Book 4 Chapter 1. What the peculiarity is of the intelligible and intellectual gods, how they illuminate imparticipable life, and are in continuity with the intelligible gods. Chapter 2. How the intelligible and intellectual gods subsist from the intelligible gods and how they communicate with the intelligible gods. Chapter 3. What the division is of the intelligible and intellectual gods according to triads, and what the difference is of these triads with respect to the intelligible triads. Chapter 4. How Socrates in the Phaedrus leads us to this order of gods. Chapter 5. That it is not proper to understand the heaven and celestial circulation celebrated in the Phaedrus as pertaining to sensibles, and many admonitions from the Platonic words themselves, that these are to be referred to the first order of heaven. Chapter 6 that the super-celestial place is not simply intelligible, but demonstrations from what is delivered about it in the Phaedrus, that it is allotted an intelligible order as in intellectuals. Chapter 7. That the sub-celestial arch is the boundary of the intelligible and intellectual gods, evinced from the peculiarities of it. Chapter 8. Why Plato characterizes this order of gods from the middle which it contains, and delivers the names of the extremes according to the habitude to this middle. Chapter 9. That Plato delivers the same mode of ascent to the intelligible, as is delivered by initiators into the mysteries. Chapter 10. What the super-celestial place is. How it proceeds from the first intelligibles. How it is supreme in intellectuals. And how Plato demonstrates its prolific power. Chapter 11. How Plato has indicated the unknown peculiarity of the summit of intelligibles and intellectuals, and why he celebrates it at one and the same time affirmatively and negatively. Chapter 12. What the negations are of the super-celestial place, that they are produced from the divine orders, what kind of negations also designate the uncolored, what the unfigured, and what the privation of contact. Chapter 13. What the things are which Plato affirms of the super-celestial place, and from what intelligible peculiarities he ascribes to it affirmative signs. Chapter 14. What the three deities of the virtues, videlicet, science, temperance, and justice, are in the super-celestial place, what order they have with respect to each other, 
and what perfection each of them imparts to the gods. Chapter 15. What the plain of truth and what the meadow are, what the unical form of intelligible nutriment is, what the twofold nutriment of the gods is, which is distributed from this intelligible food. Chapter 16. Many admonitions that the super-celestial place is triadic, and what the signs are of the three hypostases in it. Chapter 17. Who Adrastia is. What the sacred law of Adrastia is, that she ranks in the super-celestial place, and on what account she does so. Chapter 18. A summary account of what is said about the super-celestial place, unfolding the peculiarities of it. Chapter 19. Demonstrations that the connectedly containing order is in the intelligible and intellectual gods, and that it is necessary there should be three connective causes of wholes. Chapter 20. That according to Plato, the celestial circulation is the same with the connective order. Chapter 21. How we may obtain auxiliaries from what is said by Plato of the triadic division in the connective deity, and why he especially venerates the union in this triad. Chapter 22. What the theology in the Cratylus is concerning heaven, and how it is possible to collect from it by a reasoning process the middle of the intelligible and intellectual gods. Chapter 23. That the most divinely inspired of the interpreters have defined the sub-celestial arch to be a certain peculiar order, and that our preceptor has unfolded it in the most perfect manner. Chapter 24. Many admonitions that the peculiarity of the sub-celestial arch is perfective, from what Plato has delivered concerning it, and from the souls that are elevated to it. Chapter 25. What the triadic division is of the perfective order, which Plato has delivered in the sub-celestial arch. Chapter 26. What the elevation is of souls separate from bodies to the intelligible and intellectual triads. What the most blessed telete is. What muesis and epoptea are what the entire, simple, and unmoved visions are, and what the end is of all this elevation. Chapter 27. How Plato unfolds in the Parmenides from intelligibles the intelligible and intellectual orders, and what that which is common and that which is different are in the theology concerning these. Chapter 28. How the intelligible and intellectual number proceeds from intelligibles, and in what it differs from intelligible multitude. Chapter 29. How divine number adorns all beings, and what the powers in it are, which are symbolically delivered from the division of number. Chapter 30. How Parmenides has delivered the feminine and generative peculiarity of first number in what he says concerning number. Chapter 31. How we may discover in what is delivered concerning number the triadic division of the summit of intelligibles and intellectuals. Chapter 32 whether it is proper to place number prior to animal itself, or in animal itself, or posterior to it. Chapter 33. 
whence Parmenides begins to speak about number. How far he proceeds in what he says about it, and how he unfolds the different orders in it. Chapter 34 What the unknown is in divine numbers, what the generative is in them, and admonitions of these things from what is elsewhere said by Plato concerning numbers. Chapter 35 How Parmenides delivers the middle order of intelligibles and intellectuals through the one, whole and finite, and what the peculiarities are of these. Chapter 36 Whence Parmenides begins to speak about this order, and how far he proceeds in what he says about it, how he likewise unfolds the three monads in it conformably to what is said in the Phaedrus concerning them. Chapter 37 How Parmenides delivers the third order of intelligibles and intellectuals and how he unfolds the perfective peculiarity and triadic division of it. Chapter 38 An admonition what the union is of the three intelligible and intellectual triads from the conclusions of Parmenides. Chapter 39 How many theological dogmas we may assume through the order of the conclusions delivered by Parmenides in his Discourse Concerning the Intelligible and Intellectual Gods. Contents of the Chapters of Book 5 Chapter 1 How the Intellectual Orders Proceed from the Intelligible and Intellectual Gods and according to what peculiarities they subsist. Chapter 2. What the division is of the intellectual gods, and the progression according to hebdomads in this order of gods. Chapter 3. Who the three intellectual fathers are according to Plato. What the three undefiled monads are, and who the seventh deity is that is co-arranged with the two triads. Chapter 4 How, from the writings of Plato, the procession of the intellectual gods into seven hebdomads may be collected by a reasoning process. Chapter 5 Who the mighty Saturn is, according to the theology in the Cortilus, and how he is in a certain respect intelligible, and in a certain respect intellectual, in which also the dogmas are discussed concerning the union of intellect with the intelligible, and its separation from it. Chapter 6. What the kingdom of Saturn is, in what manner it is delivered by Plato in the Politicus, and of what it is the cause to the world, to the mundane gods, and to partial souls. Chapter 7. What the Saturnian life of souls is, and what peculiarities of this circulation the alien guest delivers. Chapter 8 how souls are said to be nourished by intelligibles, and what the difference is of the nutriment derived from different intelligibles. Chapter 9. What the orders are which the mighty Saturn causes to preside over holes, in which also who the Saturnian intellect is that is delivered in the Gorgias is unfolded. Chapter 10. How this god Saturn is peculiarly called by theologists insenesible, or free from old age, and how Plato has delivered this peculiarity of him. Chapter 11. Who the vivific goddess is, 
how she is the collector of the Saturnian and Jovian kingdoms, and what orders she possesses conjoined with both these kingdoms. Chapter 12 Who the third father in intellectuals is, how he proceeds from the causes prior to him, and that he is the demiurgus of the universe. Chapter 13 Demonstrations that the whole demiurgus of the universe is the third father of the intellectual gods. Chapter 14 An answer to those who say that there are three demiurgi, according to Plato, demonstrating through many arguments that the demiurgic monad is arranged prior to the demiurgic triad, in the third order of intellectuals. Chapter 15. That Timaeus especially delivers the peculiarity of the Demiurgus by calling him intellect, and that this pertains to the third of the intellectual fathers. Chapter 16. How, according to another method, it is requisite to discover the peculiarity of the demiurgus, and how the demiurgus is called in the Timaeus effector and father, in which also it is clearly shown where the paternal, where the paternal and at the same time effective, where the effective and paternal, and where the effective only are, according to Plato, and in short, in what effector and father differ. Chapter 17. How, following Timaeus, according to a third method, we may purify our conceptions concerning the demiurgic monad. Chapter 18. A theological explanation of the speech of the demiurgus in the Timaeus distinctly evolving our conceptions about the demiurgic energy. Chapter 19 What the second speech of the Demiurgus is to divisible souls, in what it differs from the former, and how in this all the measures of the life of souls are defined. Chapter 20 A summary of all that is said about the Demiurgus, following the doctrine of Timaeus. Chapter 21. Admonitions from what is said in the Cratylus that Plato attributes fabrication to Jupiter. Chapter 22. Admonitions from what is said in the Cratylus of the fabrication of Jupiter, in which also the concord is demonstrated of the theology from names, with the arrangement of the Demiurgus in the Timaeus. Chapter 23. Admonitions of the Fabrication of Jupiter from what is demonstrated in the Philebus, in which also it is shown what the royal soul and the royal intellect are. Chapter 24 demonstrations of the same thing from what is said in the Protagoras about the political science. Chapter 25. An argument showing that Jupiter is the Demiurgus and father of the universe according to Plato, from what is said in the Politicus concerning the twofold circulation of the universe. Chapter 26 admonitions of the same things from what is said in the laws concerning analogy, videlicet, that it is the judgment of Jupiter. Chapter 27. How Jupiter subsists according to cause in animal itself, and how animal itself is in Jupiter. Chapter 28 how Timaeus attributes to the Demiurgus the unknown and ineffable. Chapter 29. Why Timaeus thinks fit to denominate animal itself, and is of opinion 
that it may be known, but leaves the Demiurgus unknown and ineffable. Chapter 30 Concerning the Crater in the Timaeus, a theology teaching what the genera are that are mingled in it, and how it is the cause of the essence of souls. Chapter 31 that the crater in the Timaeus is fontal, and admonitions from the writings of Plato concerning the principle and fountain of souls. Chapter 32. That the three vivific fountains co-arranged with the Demiurgus may be assumed from what is said in the Timaeus, videlicet, the fountain of souls the fountain of the virtues, and the fountain of natures. Chapter 33 Admonitions Concerning the Undefiled Gods, that there are such gods according to Plato, and what the peculiarity is of their essence. Chapter 34 More Manifest Demonstrations of the Hypostasis of the Undefiled Gods according to Plato. Chapter 35. Admonitions through many arguments how it is proper to denominate the undefiled gods according to Plato, in which also the union of them, what their separation and what their peculiarity are, is delivered. Chapter 36. How, from what is mystically asserted by Plato, auxiliaries may be obtained concerning the seventh monad of intellectuals. Chapter 37. How Plato delivers in the Parmenides the summit of the intellectual gods. Chapter 38. How Parmenides unfolds the middle order of the intellectual breadth, and through what signs. Chapter 39 how Parmenides defines the third order of intellectuals, and through what peculiarities. Chapter 40. A Common Theory of the Intellectual Hebdomad from the Conclusions of Parmenides. Contents of the Chapters of Book 6. Chapter 1 that the ruling order of gods is in continuity with the intellectual gods, and that the division into fountains and principles may be assumed from the writings of Plato through the theory about souls. Chapter 2. How the ruling gods proceed, and that the supermundane peculiarity pertains to these gods alone. Chapter 3 what the peculiarity is of the ruling gods, that the assimilative is especially characteristic of them, and how the causes of assimilation are antecedently assumed in the Demiurgus, and how in the intelligible paradigm. Chapter 4. What the powers are of the assimilative gods, what their energies, and how many goods are imparted by them to the world and to all mundane natures. Chapter 5. What the divisions are of the assimilative gods, and that the greatest part of the discourse about them is concerning the middle orders in them. Chapter 6. Many demonstrations that both according to Plato and other theologists there is one Demiurgus prior to the three Demiurgi. Chapter 7. That Jupiter is twofold, one indeed being prior to the three sons of Saturn, but the other being one of them, and how the three proceed from Saturn and the one Jupiter. Chapter 8. That according to Plato also the Demiurgic monad subsists prior to the three sons of Saturn. Demonstrations of this from what is said in the Politicus and in the Laws. Chapter 9. 
more manifest admonitions of the same things from what is said in the Gorgias and in the Cretylus. Chapter 10. Who the three Demiurgi are, and what order they have with reference to each other. Likewise, what their progressions are, and their divisions about the world. Chapter 11. What the vivific triad is among the ruling gods, and whence we may derive auxiliaries from the writings of Plato concerning the union and division of this triad. Chapter 12. What the convertive triad of the ruling gods is, and what the monad which it contains in which also the union of Apollo with the sun is demonstrated, and it is shown how from what is said about Apollo we may be led to the theory of the solar orders. Chapter 13. What the undefiled order is of the ruling gods, and how from the writings of Plato conceptions about it may be obtained. Chapter 14 how Parmenides forms his conclusions about the ruling gods in continuity with the demiurgic order, and that he characterizes the whole order of them through similitude and dissimilitude. Chapter 15. What the supermundane and at the same time mundane genus of gods is, and how, through their own medium, they preserve the continuity of the gods that proceed from the Demiurgus. Chapter 16. How the liberated gods are characterized, and how from their liberated peculiarity they are exempt from the universe, and are co-arranged with the mundane gods. Chapter 17. What the common powers and what the common energies are of the liberated gods, according with the essence that has been delivered of them. Chapter 18. Concerning the twelve leaders or rulers mentioned in the Phaedrus, and that they have a liberated order. Chapter 19. Many and clearer demonstrations that the great leader Jupiter and all the dodecad of leaders are liberated. Chapter 20. An explanation from precedaneous causes, whence the number of the dodecad in the liberated gods is derived. Chapter 21. What the division of the liberated leaders is into two monads and one decad, and what the one division of them is. Chapter 22. The theology concerning each of the twelve gods, unfolding the peculiarities of them from the subjects of their government. Chapter 23. Concerning the mother of the fates mentioned in the Republic, likewise concerning the triad of the fates. What orders they have with reference to each other, what powers of them are delivered through divine symbols, what their energies are, and how Plato characterizes the liberated peculiarity. Chapter 24. How Parmenides forms his conclusions concerning the liberated gods immediately after the assimilative gods, and how he characterizes the order of them by touching and not touching. Contents of the Chapters of Book 7 Chapter 1 On the Mundane Gods in General, the Source of Their Progression, Their Orders, Powers, and Spheres. Chapter 2 On the Division and Allotments of the Mundane Gods. Chapter 3 that the mundane do not differ from the supermundane gods in habitudes to bodies, etc., that the providence of the gods is not circumscribed by place, that it pervades all things, and, like the light of the sun, fills whatever is capable of receiving it. 
Chapter 4. After what manner the visible celestial orbs are gods, that a celestial body is eminently allied to the incorporeal essence of the gods, that the visible are connected with the intelligible gods, and that the perfectly incorporeal are united to the sensible gods, through the essence of each being characterized by the one. Chapter 5. The nature of the mundane gods unfolded from the speech of the Demiurgus to them in the Timaeus, and what the whole conception of the speech is according to Proclus. Chapter 6. What the Demiurgus effects in the multitude of mundane gods by the first words of his speech that the words of the Demiurgus are addressed to the composite from soul and animal, videlicet, to the animal which is divine and partakes of a soul. The meaning of the words, quote, of whom I am the Demiurgus and father, close quote, etc. Chapter 7. The meaning of the words unfolded in the speech of the Demiurgus, quote, Everything, therefore, which is bound is dissoluble, but to be willing to dissolve that which is beautifully harmonized and well composed is the province of an ill nature. Close quote. Chapter 8. The following part of the speech of the Demiurgus to the mundane gods unfolded. The difference between the primarily and secondarily immortal and the primarily and secondarily indissoluble, and that the mundane gods are neither primarily immortal nor primarily indissoluble. Chapter 9. That part of the speech of the Demiurgus unfolded in which he says to the mundane gods, quote, Learn now therefore what I say to you, indicating my desire. Close quote. Chapter 10. The Development of the Remaining Part of the Speech of the Demiurgus. Chapter 11. Who the Junior Gods Are, and Why They Are Thus Called. Chapter 12. Farther Important Particulars Respecting the Fabrication of the Mundane Gods, Collected from the Timaeus and Unfolded. Chapter 13. Continuation of the Development of These Particulars Chapter 14 The Peculiarities of the Celestial Gods Separately Discussed Why the One Sphere of the Fixed Stars Comprehends a Multitude of Stars, But Each of the Planetary Spheres Convolves Only One Star, And that in each of the planetary spheres there is a number of satellites analogous to the choir of the fixed stars, subsisting with proper circulations of their own. Chapter 15. The Nature of the Moon, Mercury, Venus, and the Sun Unfolded. Chapter 16. Extract from the Oration of the Emperor Julian to the Sovereign Sun. Chapter 17. Extract from the Manuscript Scaldia of Proclus on the Cretilus of Plato concerning Apollo, in which the principal powers of the god are unfolded. Chapter 18. The Nature of the Muses unfolded from the above Manuscript Scaldia. Chapter 19. The Nature of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn unfolded the manner in which each of the seven planetary divinities becomes an animal, and is suspended from a more divine soul, and what kind of perfection it affords to the universe. Chapter 20. That all the celestial gods are beneficent, and after a similar manner the causes of good, and that the participation of them and the mixture of material with immaterial influences become the causes of the abundant difference in secondary natures. 
Chapter twenty one The Nature of Minerva Unfolded from the Commentaries of Proclus on the Timaeus the spear and shield with which this goddess in the statues of her is represented as armed explained from iamblichus and observations respecting the mundane allotment of this goddess chapter twenty two the nature of the great mundane divinity the earth unfolded from proclus on the timaeus of plato chapter twenty three the manner in which the earth is said to be the most ancient and the first of the gods within the heavens explained chapter twenty four on the essence of the sublunary deities what plato says of them in the timaeus unfolded chapter twenty five where the sublunary gods are to be arranged and the meaning of the subsequent words of plato developed chapter twenty six the nature of the sublunary gods more fully unfolded on the demoniacal order and that about each of the fabricators of generation there is a coordinate angelical demoniacal and heroical multitude which retains the appellation of its producing monad chapter twenty seven what Pythagoras says in the Sacred Discourse, what the Orphic traditions are concerning Phanes, Night, Heaven, Saturn, Jupiter, and Bacchus, that Plato begins the theogony of the sublunary gods from heaven and earth, and not from Phanes and Night, and why he does so. Chapter 28 on the two principles heaven and earth what each of them is and particularly concerning the power of heaven chapter twenty nine the whole theory of earth unfolded and also the theory of ocean and tethys that the causes of these are in the intellectual gods and likewise in the sensible universe chapter thirty the theory of forces saturn and rhea unfolded chapter thirty one the nature of the sublunary jupiter and juno unfolded and why plato comprehends in this ennead we dedicate heaven and earth ocean and tethys forces saturn rhea jupiter and juno the gods who are the fabricators of generation Chapter thirty two Why Plato denominates the sublunary deities quote, such as become apparent when they please. Close quote. General observations respecting the gods that govern generation. Chapter thirty three On the summit or monad of all the mundane gods, Bacchus, and on the mundane soul which is the immediate participant of the Bacchic intellect. Chapter 34. How the mundane gods are characterized in the Parmenides of Plato. Chapter 35. A development of what Plato says in the Phaedrus about Boreas and Orithia, the centaurs, chimeras, gorgons, pegasuses, typhons, Achilois, and the Nymphs. Chapter 36. The meaning of Plato unfolded in what he says about Pan, Tartarus, Prometheus, Cadmus, and the Sirens. Chapter 37. A development of Plato's theological conceptions respecting nature, fate, and fortune. Chapter 38. What time day and night month and year are so far as they are deities according to the theology of plato chapter thirty nine a discussion of the order of divine souls who are deified by always participating of the gods chapter forty a development of the nature of love from the manuscript 
Commentary of Proclus on the First Alcibiades of Plato. Chapter 41. A Continuation of the Same Subject. Chapter 42. The Nature of Demons More Fully Disclosed. An Extract from the Manuscript. Commentary of Proclus on the First Alcibiades on this subject. Chapter 43. On the Demons Who Are Allotted the Superintendence of Mankind. Chapter 44. On the Demon of Socrates, the Peculiarity of this Demon, and that it belonged to the Apollonaical Series. Chapter 45. Important Information Concerning Demons from the Manuscript Scalia of Proclus on the Cratylus of Plato, and also from the Manuscript Commentary of Olympiodorus on the Phaedo of Plato. Chapter 46. The Nature of Those Human Souls That Are of an Heroic Characteristic Unfolded what Plato says of these souls in the Cratylus, his meaning elucidated from the manuscript Scalia of Proclus on that dialogue. Chapter 47. How the triple genera, that are the perpetual attendants of the gods, are indicated in the Parmenides of Plato. Chapter 48. An elucidation from Proclus of what Plato says in the Timaeus in celebration of the divinity of the world, so far as the whole of it is a god. Chapter 49. A further elucidation from Proclus of the same subject. Chapter 50. The meaning of the words of Plato, quote, and causing circle to revolve in a circle, he established heaven, it est the world, one, only, solitary nature, close quote, unfolded from Proclus. Chapter 51. What Plato says in the Timaeus about the name of the world, with the elucidations of Proclus. End of Contents of the Chapters An explanation of certain terms found in Platonic Theology by Proclus, translated by Thomas Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An explanation of certain terms which are unusual or have a meaning different from their common acceptation and which there was a necessity of introducing in the translation of this work. Composite, Synthetos. I have used the word composite instead of compounded, because the latter rather denotes the mingling than the contiguous union of one thing with another, which the former, through its derivation from the Latin word compositus, solely denotes. Demiurgus of holes, Demiurgus ton olon. The artificer of the universe is thus denominated because he produces the universe so far as it is a whole, and likewise all the holes it contains, by his own immediate energy. Other subordinate powers cooperating with him in the production of parts. Hence, he produces the universe totally and at once. Desire. Epithumia. Is an irrational appetite solely directed to external objects and to the gratification arising from the possession of them. Dianoia. Dianoia from whence dianoetic is the discursive energy of reason, diexodike tu logu energia, or, according to its most accurate signification, 
It is that power of the soul which reasons scientifically, deriving the principles of its reasoning from intellect, or the power which sees truth intuitively. Doxastic, formed from doxa, opinion, is the last of the Gnostic powers of the rational soul, and knows that a thing is, but is ignorant of the cause of it, or why it is. The knowledge of the dioti, or why a thing is, being the province of Dianoia. Guest. Xenos. This word, in its more ample signification in the Greek, denotes a stranger, but properly implies one who receives another, or is himself received at an entertainment. In the dialogues of Plato, therefore, and consequently in this work of Proclus, when he cites the dialogues in which this word occurs, wherever one of the speakers is introduced as a xenos, I have translated this word guest, as being more conformable to the genius of Plato's dialogues, which may be justly called rich mental banquets, and consequently the speakers in them may be considered as so many guests. Hence, in the Timaeus, the persons of that dialogue are expressly spoken of as guests, from having been feasted with discourse. Hyparxis. Hyparxis. The first principle, or foundation, as it were, of the essence of a thing, Hence also it is the summit of essence. Imparticipable, amethectos. One thing is said to be imparticipable with respect to another, to which it is superior, when it is not consubsistent with it. Intellectual projection. The immediate energy of intellect is thus denominated, because it is an intuitive perception, or an immediate darting forth, as it were, to its proper object, the intelligible. Monad, monas, in divine natures is that which contains distinct, but at the same time profoundly united multitude, and which produces a multitude exquisitely allied to itself. But in the sensible universe, the first monad is the world itself, which comprehends in itself all the multitude of which it is the cause, in conjunction with the cause of all. The second monad is the inerratic sphere. In the third place, the spheres of the planets succeed, each of which is also a monad, comprehending an appropriate multitude, and in the fourth and last place are the spheres of the elements, which are in a similar manner monads. All these monads, likewise, are denominated olotetes, wholenesses, and have a perpetual subsistence. Permanency, stasis. The proper word for rest in Greek is eremia, and Simplicius justly observes that not every stasis is eremia, but that only which is after motion. This word is employed by Plato in the Sopista to express one of the five genera of being videlicet, essence, permanency, stasis, motion, sameness, and difference, in which place it evidently does not signify rest. Fantasy, or imagination, fantasia, is morphotice noesis, it is a figured intelligence, because all the perceptions of this power are inward and not external, like those of sense, 
and are accompanied with figure. Psychical, psychicos, it is pertaining to soul, in the same manner as physicos, physical, is something pertaining to nature. Reason, logos, this word in platonic writers signifies either that inward discursive energy called reasoning or a certain productive and seminal principle or that which is indicative and definitive of a thing hence logoi or reasons in the soul are gnostically producing principles unical eneios that which is characterized by unity. Uniform, enoides, this word, when it occurs in Proclus and other Platonic writers, signifies that which has the form of the one, and not, as in Johnson, that which keeps its tenor, or is similar to itself. End of an explanation of certain terms. Chapters 1 to 3 of Book 1 of Platonic Theology by Proclus. Translated by Thomas Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Proclus, the Platonic successor on the theology of plato book one chapter one o pericles to me the dearest of friends i am of opinion that the whole philosophy of plato was at first unfolded into light through the beneficent will of superior natures exhibiting the intellect concealed in them and the truth subsisting together with beings, to souls conversant with generation, so far as it is lawful for them to participate of such supernatural and mighty good, and again that afterwards, having received its perfection, returning as it were into itself, and becoming unapparent to many who professed to philosophize, and who earnestly desired to engage in the investigation of true being, it again advanced into light. But I particularly think that the mystic doctrine respecting divine concerns, which is purely established on a sacred foundation, and which perpetually subsists with the gods themselves, became thence apparent to such as are capable of enjoying it for a time, through one man whom I should not err in calling the primary leader and hierophant of those true mysteries, into which souls separated from terrestrial places are initiated, and of those entire and stable visions which those participate who genuinely embrace a happy and blessed life. But this philosophy shone forth at first from him so venerably and arcanely, as if established in sacred temples, and within their adita, and being unknown to many who have entered into these holy places in certain orderly periods of time, proceeded as much as was possible for it into light through certain true priests, and who embraced a life corresponding to the tradition of such mystic concerns. It appears likewise to me that the whole place became splendid, and that illuminations of divine spectacles everywhere presented themselves to the view. These interpreters of the epoptea, or mystic speculations of Plato, who have unfolded to us all sacred narrations of divine concerns, and who were allotted a nature similar to their leader, I should determine to be the Egyptian Plotinus, 
and those who received the theory from him i mean amelius and porphyry together with those in the third place who were produced like virile statues from these videlicet iamblicus and theodorus and any others who after these following this divine choir have energized about the doctrines of plato with a divinely inspired mind from these he who after the gods has been our leader to everything beautiful and good receiving in an undefiled manner the most genuine and pure light of truth in the bosom of his soul made us a partaker of all the rest of plato's philosophy communicated to us that arcane information which he had received from those more ancient than himself and caused us in conjunction with him to be divinely agitated about the mystic truth of divine concerns to this man therefore should we undertake to return thanks adequate to the benefits which we have received from him the whole of time would not be sufficient but if it is necessary not only that we should have received from others the transcendent good of the platonic philosophy but that we should leave to posterity monuments of those blessed spectacles of which we have been spectators and emulators to the utmost of our ability under a leader the most perfect of the present time and who arrived at the summit of philosophy perhaps we shall act properly in invoking the gods that they will enkindle the light of truth in our soul and in supplicating the attendants and ministers of better natures to direct our intellect and lead it to the all-perfect divine and elevated end of the platonic theory for i think that everywhere he who participates in the least degree of intelligence will begin his undertakings from the gods and especially in explications respecting the gods for we can no otherwise be able to understand a divine nature than by being perfected through the light of the gods nor divulge it to others unless governed by them and exempt from multiform opinions and the variety which subsists in words preserving at the same time the interpretation of divine names knowing therefore this and complying with the exhortation of the platonic timaeus we in the first place establish the gods as leaders of the doctrine respecting themselves but may they in consequence of hearing our prayers be propitious to us and benignantly approaching guide the intellect of our soul and lead it about the vesta of plato and to the arduous sublimities of this speculation where when arrived we shall receive all the truth concerning them and shall obtain the best end of our parturient conceptions of divine concerns desiring to know something respecting them inquiring about them of others and at the same time as far as we are able exploring them ourselves chapter two and thus much by way of preface but it is necessary that i should unfold the mode of the proposed doctrine what it is requisite to expect it will be and define the preparatives which a hearer of it ought to possess that being properly adapted he may approach not to our discourses but to the intellectually elevated and deific philosophy of plato for it is proper that convenient aptitudes of auditors should be proposed according to the forms of discourses just as in the mysteries those who are skilful in concerns of this kind previously prepare receptacles for the gods and neither always use the same inanimate particulars nor other animals nor men in order to procure the presence of the divinities but 
that alone out of each of these which is naturally capable of participating divine illumination is by them introduced to the proposed mystic rites the present discourse therefore will first of all be divided by me into three parts in the beginning considering all those common conceptions concerning the gods which plato summarily delivers together with the power and dignity everywhere of theological axioms but in the middle of this work speculating the total orders of the gods enumerating their peculiarities defining their progressions after the manner of plato and referring everything to the hypotheses of theologists and in the end speaking concerning the gods which are in different places celebrated in the platonic writings whether they are supermundane or mundane and referring the theory respecting them to the total genera of the divine orders in every part of this work likewise we shall prefer the clear distinct and simple to the contraries of these and such things as are delivered through symbols we shall transfer to a clear doctrine concerning them but such as are delivered through images we shall transmit to their exemplars such things too as are written in a more affirmative way we shall examine by causal reasonings but such as are composed through demonstrations we shall investigate and besides this explain the mode of truth which they contain and render it known to the hearers and of things enigmatically proposed we shall elsewhere discover perspicuity not from foreign hypotheses but from the most genuine writings of plato but with respect to the things which immediately occur to the hearers of these we shall contemplate the consent with things themselves and from all these particulars one perfect form of the platonic theology will present itself to our view together with its truth which pervades through the whole of divine intellections and the one intellect which generated all the beauty of this theology and the mystic evolution of this theory such therefore as i have said will be my present treatise but the auditor of the proposed dogmas is supposed to be adorned with the moral virtues and to be one who has bound by the reason of virtue all the illiberal and inharmonious motions of the soul and harmonized them to the one form of intellectual prudence for as socrates says it is not lawful for the pure to be touched by the impure but every vicious man is perfectly impure and the contrary character is pure he must likewise have been exercised in all the logical methods and have contemplated many irreprehensible conceptions about analyses and many about divisions the contraries to these agreeably as it appears to me to the exhortation of parmenides to socrates for prior to such a contest in arguments the knowledge of the divine genera and of the truth established in them is difficult and impervious but in the third place he must not be unskilled in physics for he who has been conversant with the multiform opinions of physiologists and has after a manner explored in images the causes of beings will more easily advance to the nature of separate and primary essences an auditor therefore of the present work as i have said must not be ignorant of the truth contained in the phenomena nor unacquainted with the paths of erudition and the disciplines which they contain for through these we obtain a more immaterial knowledge of a divine essence but all these must be bound together in the leader intellect being likewise a partaker of the dialectic of plato 
meditating those immaterial energies which are separate from corporeal powers, and desiring to contemplate by intelligence in conjunction with reason true beings, our auditor must genuinely apply himself to the interpretation of divine and blessed dogmas, and fill his soul according to the oracle with profound love, since, as Plato somewhere observes, for the apprehension of this theory a better assistant than love cannot be obtained. He must, likewise, be exercised in the truth which pervades through all things, and must excite his intelligible eye to real and perfect truth. He must establish himself in a firm, immovable, and safe kind of divine knowledge, and must be persuaded not to admire anything else, nor even to direct his attention to other things, but must hasten to divine light with an intrepid reasoning energy, and with the power of an unwearied life, and in short, must propose to himself such a kind of energy and rest as it becomes him to possess, who intends to be such a corophias as Socrates describes in the Theotetus. Such, then, is the magnitude of our hypothesis, and such the mode of the discourses about it. Before, however, I enter on the narration of the things proposed, I wish to speak about theology itself, its different modes, and what theological forms Plato approves, and what he rejects, that these, being previously known, we may more easily learn in what follows the auxiliaries of the demonstrations themselves. Chapter 3. All, therefore, that have ever touched upon theology have called things first, according to nature, gods, and have said that the theological science is conversant about these. And some, indeed, have considered a corporeal essence as that alone which has any existence, and have placed in a secondary rank with respect to essence all the genera of incorporeal natures, considering the principles of things as having a corporeal form, and evincing that the habit in us by which we know these is corporeal. But others, suspending indeed all bodies from incorporeal natures, and defining the first hyparxis to be in soul, and the powers of soul, call, as it appears to me, the best of souls, gods, and denominate the science which proceeds as far as to these, and which knows these, theology. But such as produce the multitude of souls from another more ancient principle, and establish intellect as the leader of wholes, these assert that the best end is a union of the soul with intellect, and consider the intellectual form of life as the most honorable of all things. They doubtless too consider theology and the discussion of intellectual essence as one and the same. All these, therefore, as I have said, call the first and most self-sufficient principles of things gods, and the science respecting these theology. The divine narration, however, of Plato alone despises all corporeal natures with reference to principles, because, indeed, everything divisible and endued with interval is naturally unable either to produce or preserve itself, but possesses its being, energy and passivity through soul, and the motions which soul contains. But Plato demonstrates that the psychical essence, it est, the essence pertaining to soul, is more ancient than bodies, but is suspended from an intellectual hypostasis. For every thing which is moved according to time, though it may be self-moved, is indeed of a more ruling nature than things moved by others, but is posterior to an eternal motion. He shows, therefore, as we have said, that intellect is the father and cause of bodies and souls, 
and that all things both subsist and energize about it, which are allotted a life conversant with transitions and evolutions. Plato, however, proceeds to another principle entirely exempt from intellect, more incorporeal and ineffable, and from which all things, even though you should speak of such as are last, have necessarily a subsistence. For all things are not naturally disposed to participate of soul, but such things only as are allotted in themselves a more clear or obscure life. Nor are all things able to enjoy intellect and being, but such only as subsist according to form. But it is necessary that the principle of all things should be participated by all things, if it does not desert anything, since it is the cause of all things which in any respect are said to have a subsistence. Plato, having divinely discovered this first principle of wholes, which is more excellent than intellect, and is concealed in inaccessible recesses, and having exhibited these three causes and monads, and evinced them to be above bodies, I mean soul, the first intellect, and a union above intellect, produces from these as monads their proper numbers, one multitude indeed being uniform, but the second intellectual, and the third psychical. For every monad is the leader of a multitude coordinate to itself. But as Plato connects bodies with souls, so likewise he connects souls with intellectual forms, and these again with the unities of beings. But he converts all things to one imparticipable unity, and having run back as far as to this unity, he considers himself as having obtained the highest end of the theory of wholes, and that this is the truth respecting the gods, which is conversant with the unities of beings, and which delivers their progressions and peculiarities, the contact of beings with them, and the orders of forms which are suspended from these, unical hypostases. But he teaches us that the theory respecting intellect, and the forms and the genera revolving about intellect, is posterior to the science which is conversant with the gods themselves. Likewise that the intellectual theory apprehends intelligibles, and the forms which are capable of being known by the soul through the projecting energy of intellect but that the theological science transcending this is conversant with arcane and ineffable hyparxes, and pursues their separation from each other, and their unfolding into light from one cause of all. Whence I am of opinion that the intellectual peculiarity of the soul is capable of apprehending intellectual forms, and the difference which subsists in them, but that the summit, and, as they say, flower of intellect and hyparxis, is conjoined with the unities of beings, and through these, with the occult union of all the divine unities. For, as we contain many Gnostic powers through this alone, we are naturally capable of being conjoined with and participating this occult union. For the genus of the gods cannot be apprehended by sense, because it is exempt from all bodies, nor by opinion and dianoia, for these are divisible and come into contact with multiform concerns, nor by intelligence in conjunction with reason, for knowledge of this kind belongs to true beings. But the hyparxis of the gods rides on beings, and is defined according to the union itself of wholes. It remains, therefore, if it be admitted that a divine nature can be in any respect known, that it must be apprehended by the hyparxis of the soul, and through this, as far as it is possible, be known. For we say that everywhere things similar can be known by the similar, 
videlicet the sensible by sense, the doxastic by opinion, the dianoetic by dianoia, and the intelligible by intellect, so that the most unical nature must be known by the one, and the ineffable by that which is ineffable. Indeed, Socrates, in the first Alcibiades, rightly observes that the soul, entering into herself, will behold all other things and deity itself. For, verging to her own union, and to the centre of all life, laying aside multitude and the variety of the all-manifold powers which she contains, she ascends to the highest watch-tower of beings, and, as in the most holy of the mysteries, they say, that the mystics at first meet with the multiform and many-shaped genera which are hurled forth before the gods. But on entering the interior parts of the temple, unmoved and guarded by the mystic rites, they genuinely receive in their bosom divine illumination, and, divested of their garments, as they would say, participate of a divine nature. The same mode, as it appears to me, takes place in the speculation of wholes. For the soul, when looking at things posterior to herself, beholds the shadows and images of beings. But when she converts herself to herself, she evolves her own essence, and the reasons which she contains. And, at first indeed, she only as it were beholds herself. But when she penetrates more profoundly into the knowledge of herself, she finds in herself both intellect and the orders of beings. When, however, she proceeds into her interior recesses, and into the aditum, as it were, of the soul, she perceives with her eye closed the genus of the gods and the unities of beings. For all things are in us psychically, and through this we are naturally capable of knowing all things by exciting the powers and the images of wholes which we contain. And this is the best employment of our energy, to be extended to a divine nature itself, having our powers at rest, to revolve harmoniously round it, to excite all the multitude of the soul to this union, and laying aside all such things as are posterior to the one, to become seated and conjoined with that which is ineffable and beyond all things. For it is lawful for the soul to ascend, till she terminates her flight in the principle of things. But arriving thither, beholding the place which is there, descending thence, and directing her course through beings, likewise evolving the multitude of forms, exploring their monads and their numbers, and apprehending intellectually how each is suspended from its proper unity, then we may consider her as possessing the most perfect science of divine natures, perceiving in a uniform manner the progressions of the gods into beings and the distinctions of beings about the gods. Such then, according to Plato's decision, is our theologist, and theology is a habit of this kind, which unfolds the hyparxis itself of the gods, separates and speculates their unknown and unical light from the peculiarity of their participants, and announces it to such as are worthy of this energy, which is both blessed and comprehends all things at once. End of chapter 3《ラプトゥス》of Book I of Platonic Theology by Proclus, translated by Thomas Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. After this all-perfect comprehension of the first theory, we must deliver the modes according to which Plato teaches us mystic conceptions of divine natures. For he appears not to have pursued everywhere the same mode of doctrine about these, 
but sometimes according to a deific energy and at other times dialectically he evolves the truth concerning them and sometimes he symbolically announces their ineffable peculiarities but at other times he recurs to them from images and discovers in them the primary causes of wholes for in the phaedrus being inspired by the nymphs and having exchanged human intelligence for a better possession fury he unfolds with a divine mouth many arcane dogmas concerning the intellectual gods and many concerning the liberated rulers of the universe who lead upwards the multitude of mundane gods to the monads which are intelligible and separate from mundane wholes but relating still more about those gods who are allotted the world he celebrates their intellections and mundane fabrications their unpolluted providence and government of souls and whatever else socrates delivers enthusiastically or according to a divinely inspired energy in that dialogue as he clearly asserts ascribing at the same time this fury to the deities of the place but in the sopista dialectically contending about being and the separate hypostasis of the one from beings and doubting against those more ancient than himself he shows how all beings are suspended from their cause and the first being but that being itself participates of the unity which is exempt from the whole of things that it is a passive one but not the one itself being subject to and united to the one but not being that which is primarily one in a similar manner too in the parmenides he unfolds dialectically the progressions of being from the one and the transcendency of the one through the first hypotheses and this as he asserts in that dialogue according to the most perfect division of this method and again in the gorgias he relates the fable concerning the three demiurgi or fabricators and their demiurgic allotment which indeed is not only a fable but a true narration but in the banquet he speaks concerning the union of love and in the protagoras about the distribution of mortal animals from the gods in a symbolical manner concealing the truth respecting divine natures and as far as to mere indication unfolding his mind to the most genuine of his hearers if likewise you are willing that i should mention the doctrine delivered through the mathematical disciplines and the discussion of divine concerns from ethical or physical discourses of which many may be contemplated in the timaeus many in the dialogue called the politicus and many may be seen scattered in other dialogues here likewise to you who are desirous of knowing divine concerns through images the method will be apparent for all these shadow forth the powers of things divine the politicus for instance the fabrication in the heavens but the figures of the five elements delivered in geometrical proportions in the timaeus represent in images the peculiarities of the gods who ride on the parts of the universe and the divisions of the psychical essence in that dialogue shadow forth the total orders of the gods i omit to mention that plato composes polities assimilating them to divine natures and to the whole world and adorns them from the powers which it contains all these therefore through the similitude of mortal to divine concerns 
exhibit to us in images the progressions, orders, and fabrications of divine natures. And such are the modes of theologic doctrine employed by Plato. It is evident, however, from what has been already said, that they are necessarily so many in number. For those who treat of divine concerns in an indicative manner, either speak symbolically and fabulously, or through images. But of those who openly announce their conceptions, some frame their discourses according to science, but others according to inspiration from the gods. And he who desires to signify divine concerns through symbols is Orphic, and in short, accords with those who write fables concerning the gods, but he who does this through images is Pythagoric. For the mathematical disciplines were invented by the Pythagoreans in order to a reminiscence of divine concerns, at which, through these as images, they endeavor to arrive. For they refer both numbers and figures to the gods, according to the testimony of their historians. But the entheastic character, or he who is under the influence of divine inspiration, unfolding the truth itself by itself concerning the gods, most perspicuously ranks among the highest initiators. For these do not think proper to unfold the divine orders, or their peculiarities to their familiars, through certain veils, but announce their powers and their numbers in consequence of being moved by the gods themselves. But the tradition of divine concerns, according to science, is the illustrious prerogative of the philosophy of Plato. For Plato alone, as it appears to me, of all those who are known to us, has attempted methodically to divide and reduce into order the regular progression of the divine genera their mutual difference, the common peculiarities of the total orders, and the distributed peculiarities in each. But the truth of this will be evident when we frame precedaneous demonstrations about the Parmenides and all the divisions which it contains. At present we shall observe that Plato does not admit all the fabulous figments of dramatic composition, but those only which have reference to the beautiful and the good, and which are not discordant with a divine essence. For that mythological mode which indicates divine concerns through conjecture is ancient, concealing truth under a multitude of veils, and proceeding in a manner similar to nature, which extends sensible figments of intelligibles, material of immaterial, partible, of impartable natures, and images, and things which have a false being, of things perfectly true. But Plato rejects the more tragical mode of mythologizing of the ancient poets, who thought proper to establish an arcane theology respecting the gods, and on this account devised wanderings, sections, battles, lacerations, rapes and adulteries of the gods, and many other such symbols of the truth about divine natures which this theology conceals. This mode he rejects, and asserts that it is in every respect most foreign from erudition. But he considers those mythological discourses about the gods as more persuasive and more adapted to truth and the philosophic habit, which assert that a divine nature is the cause of all good, but of no evil, and that it is void of all mutation, ever preserving its own order immutable, and comprehending in itself the fountain of truth, but never becoming the cause of any deception to others. For such types of theology Socrates delivers in the Republic, all the fables, therefore, of Plato, guarding the truth in concealment, 
have not even their externally apparent apparatus discordant with our undisciplined and unperverted anticipation respecting the gods but they bring with them an image of the mundane composition in which both the apparent beauty is worthy of divinity and a beauty more divine than this is established in the unapparent lives and powers of the gods this therefore is one of the mythological modes respecting divine concerns which from the apparently unlawful irrational and inordinate passes into order and bound and regards as its scope the composition of the beautiful and good but there is another mode which he delivers in the phaedrus and this consists in everywhere preserving theological fables unmixed with physical narrations and being careful in no respect to confound or exchange theology and the physical theory with each other for as a divine essence is separate from the whole of nature in like manner it is perfectly proper that discourses respecting the gods should be pure from physical disquisitions for a mixture of this kind is says he laborious and to make physical passions the end of mythological conjecture is the employment of no very good man such for instance as considering through his pretended wisdom chimera gorgon and things of a similar kind as the same with physical figments socrates in the phaedrus reprobating this mode of mythologizing represents its patrons as saying under the figure of a fable that orithia sporting with the wind boreas and being thrown down the rocks means nothing more than that orithia who was immortal was ravished by boreas through love for it appears to me that fabulous narrations about the gods should always have their concealed meaning more venerable than the apparent so that if certain persons introduce to us physical hypotheses of platonic fables and such as are conversant with sublunary affairs we must say that they entirely wander from the intention of the philosopher and that those hypotheses alone are interpreters of the truth contained in these fables which have for their scope a divine immaterial and separate hypostasis and which looking to this make the compositions and analyses of the fables adapted to our inherent anticipations of divine concerns chapter five as we have therefore enumerated all these modes of the platonic theology and have shown what compositions and analyses of fables are adapted to the truth respecting the gods let us consider in the next place whence and from what dialogues principally we think the dogmas of plato concerning the gods may be collected and by a speculation of what types or forms we may be able to distinguish his genuine writings from those spurious compositions which are ascribed to him the truth then concerning the gods pervades as i may say through all the platonic dialogues and in all of them conceptions of the first philosophy venerable clear and supernatural are disseminated in some indeed more obscurely but in others more conspicuously conceptions which excite those that are in any respect able to participate of them to the immaterial and separate essence of the gods and as in each part of the universe and in nature herself the demiurgus of all that the world contains established resemblances of the unknown hyparxis of the gods that all things might be converted to a divine nature through their alliance with it in like manner i am of opinion that the divine intellect of plato weaves conceptions about the gods in all his writings and leaves nothing deprived of the mention of divinity 
that from the whole of them a reminiscence of wholes may be obtained and imparted to the genuine lovers of divine concerns if however it be requisite to lay before the reader those dialogues out of many which principally unfold to us the mystic discipline about the gods i should not err in ranking among this number the phaedo and phaedrus the banquet and the philebus and together with these the sopista and politicus the cratylus and the timaeus for all these are full through the whole of themselves as i may say of the divine science of plato but i should place in the second rank after these the fable in the gorgias and that in the protagoras likewise the assertions about the providence of the gods in the laws and such things as are delivered about the fates or the mother of the fates or the circulations of the universe in the tenth book of the republic again you may if you please place in the third rank those epistles through which we may be able to arrive at the science about divine natures for in these mention is made of the three kings and very many other divine dogmas worthy the platonic theory are delivered it is necessary therefore looking to these to explore in these each order of the gods thus from the philebus we may receive the science respecting the one good and the two first principles of things together with the triad which is unfolded into light from these for you will find all these distinctly delivered to us by plato in that dialogue but from the timaeus you may obtain the theory about intelligibles a divine narration about the demiurgic monad and the most full truth about the mundane gods but from the phaedrus you may acquire a scientific knowledge of all the intelligible and intellectual genera and of the liberated orders of gods which are proximately established above the celestial circulations from the politicus you may obtain the theory of the fabrication in the heavens of the uneven periods of the universe and of the intellectual causes of those periods but from the sopista the whole sublunary generation and the peculiarity of the gods who are allotted the sublunary region and preside over its generations and corruptions but with respect to each of the gods we may obtain many conceptions adapted to sacred concerns from the banquet many from the cratylus and many from the phaedo for in each of these dialogues more or less mention is made of divine names from which it is easy for those who are exercised in divine concerns to discover by a reasoning process the peculiarities of each it is necessary however to evince that each of the dogmas accords with platonic principles and the mystic traditions of theologists for all the grecian theology is the progeny of the mystic tradition of orpheus pythagoras first of all learning from aglaophemus the orgies of the gods but plato in the second place receiving an all-perfect science of the divinities from the pythagoric and orphic writings for in the philebus referring the theory about the two species of principles bound and infinity to the pythagoreans he calls them men dwelling with the gods and truly blessed philolaus therefore the pythagorean has left us in writing many admirable conceptions about these principles celebrating their common progression into beings and their separate fabrication of things but in the timaeus plato endeavouring to teach us about the sublunary gods and their order flies to theologists calls them the sons of the gods and makes them the fathers of the truth about those divinities and lastly 
he delivers the orders of the sublunary gods proceeding from wholes according to the progression delivered by them of the intellectual kings again in the cratylus he follows the traditions of theologists respecting the order of the divine processions but in the gorgias he adopts the homeric dogma respecting the triadic hypostasis of the demiurgi and in short he everywhere discourses concerning the gods agreeably to the principles of theologists rejecting indeed the tragical part of mythological fiction but establishing first hypotheses in common with the authors of fables chapter six perhaps however some one may here object to us that we do not in a proper manner exhibit the everywhere dispersed theology of plato and that we endeavor to heap together different particulars from different dialogues as if we were studious of collecting together many things into one mixture instead of deriving them all from one and the same fountain for if this were the case we might refer different dogmas to different treatises of plato but we shall by no means have a precedaneous doctrine concerning the gods nor will there be any dialogue which presents us with an all-perfect and entire procession of the divine genera and their coordination with each other but we shall be similar to those who endeavour to obtain a whole from parts through the want of a whole prior to parts and to weave together the perfect from things imperfect when on the contrary the imperfect ought to have the first cause of its generation in the perfect for the timaeus for instance will teach us the theory of the intelligible genera and the phaedrus appears to present us with a methodical account of the first intellectual orders but where will be the coordination of intellectuals to intelligibles and what will be the generation of second from first natures in short after what manner the progression of the divine orders takes place from the one principle of all things and how in the generations of the gods the orders between the one and all perfect number are filled up we shall be unable to evince farther still it may be said where will be the venerableness of your boasted science about divine natures for it is absurd to call these dogmas which are collected from many places platonic and which as you acknowledge are introduced from foreign names to the philosophy of plato nor are you able to evince one whole entire truth about divine natures perhaps indeed they will say certain persons junior to plato have delivered in their writings and left to their disciples one perfect form of theology you therefore are able to produce one entire theory about nature from the timaeus but from the republic or laws the most beautiful dogmas about manners and which tend to one form of philosophy alone therefore neglecting the treatise of plato which contains all the good of the first philosophy and which may be called the summit of the whole theory you will be deprived of the most perfect knowledge of beings unless you are so much infatuated as to boast on account of fabulous fictions though an analysis of things of this kind abounds with much of the probable but not of the demonstrative besides things of this kind are only delivered adventitiously in the platonic dialogues as the fable in the protagoras which is inserted for the sake of the politic science and the demonstrations respecting it in like manner the fable in the republic is inserted for the sake of justice but in the gorgias for the sake of temperance for plato combines fabulous narrations with investigations of ethical dogmas not for the sake of the fables 
but for the sake of the leading design that we may not only exercise the intellectual part of the soul through contending reasons but that the divine part of the soul may more perfectly receive the knowledge of beings through its sympathy with more mystic concerns for from other discourses we appear similar to those who are compelled to the reception of truth but from fables we suffer in an ineffable manner and call forth our unperverted conceptions venerating the mystic information which they contain hence as it appears to me timaeus with great propriety thinks it fit that we should produce the divine genera following the inventors of fables as the sons of the gods and subscribe to their always generating secondary natures from such as are first though they should speak without demonstration for this kind of discourse is not demonstrative but entheastic and was invented by the ancients not through necessity but for the sake of persuasion not regarding mere discipline but sympathy with things themselves but if you are willing to speculate not only the causes of fables but of other theological dogmas you will find that some of them are scattered in the platonic dialogues for the sake of ethical and others for the sake of physical considerations for in the philebus plato discourses concerning bound and the infinite for the sake of pleasure and a life according to intellect for i think the latter are species of the former in the timaeus the discourse about the intelligible gods is assumed for the sake of the proposed physiology on which account it is everywhere necessary that images should be known from paradigms but that the paradigms of material things should be immaterial of sensibles intelligible and that the paradigms of physical forms should be separate but again in the phaedrus plato celebrates the supercelestial place the subcelestial profundity and every genus under this for the sake of amatory mania a manner in which the reminiscence of souls takes place and the passage to these from hence but everywhere as i may say the leading end is either physical or political while the conceptions about divine natures take place either for the sake of invention or perfection how therefore can such a theory as yours be any longer venerable and supernatural and worthy to be studied beyond everything when it is neither able to evince the whole in itself nor the perfect nor that which is precedaneous in the writings of plato but is destitute of all these is violent and not spontaneous and does not possess a genuine but an adventitious order as in a drama and such are the objections which may be urged against our design chapter seven i however to an objection of this kind shall make a just and perspicuous reply i say then that plato everywhere discourses about the gods agreeably to ancient rumour and to the nature of things and sometimes indeed for the sake of the cause of the things proposed he reduces them to the principles of the dogmas and thence as from a watch-tower contemplates the nature of the thing proposed but sometimes he establishes the theological science as the leading end for in the phaedrus his subject respects intelligible beauty and the participation of beauty pervading from thence through all things and in the banquet it respects the amatory order but if it be necessary to survey in one platonic dialogue the all-perfect whole and connected extending as far as to the complete number of theology i shall perhaps assert a paradox 
and which will alone be apparent to our familiars. We ought, however, to dare, since we have entered on such like arguments, and affirm against our opponents that the Parmenides, and the mystic conceptions it contains, will accomplish all you desire. For in this dialogue all the divine genera proceed in order from the first cause, and evince their mutual connection and dependence on each other. And those which are highest indeed, connate with the one, and of a primary nature, are allotted a unical, occult, and simple form of hyparxis, but such as are last, are multiplied, are distributed into many parts, and are exuberant in number, but inferior in power to such as are of a higher order, and such as are middle, according to a convenient proportion, are more composite than their causes, but more simple than their proper progeny. And in short, all the axioms of the theologic science appear in perfection in this dialogue, and all the divine orders are exhibited subsisting in connection, so that this is nothing else than the celebrated generation of the gods, and the procession of every kind of being from the ineffable and unknown cause of wholes. The Parmenides, therefore, enkindles in the lovers of Plato the whole and perfect light of the theological science. But after this, the before-mentioned dialogues distribute parts of the mystic discipline about the gods, and all of them, as I may say, participate of divine wisdom, and excite our spontaneous conceptions respecting a divine nature. And it is necessary to refer all the parts of this mystic discipline to these dialogues, and these again to the one and all-perfect theory of the Parmenides. For thus, as it appears to me, we shall suspend the more imperfect from the perfect, and parts from wholes, and shall exhibit reasons assimilated to things of which, according to the Platonic Timaeus, they are interpreters. Such, then, is our answer to the objection which may be urged against us. And thus we refer the Platonic theory to the Parmenides, just as the Timaeus is acknowledged by all who are in the least degree intelligent to contain the whole science about nature. End of chapter 7chapters 8 to 10 of book 1 of platonic theology by proclus translated by thomas taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 8 i appear however by these means to have excited for myself a twofold contest against those who attempt to investigate the writings of Plato, and I see two sorts of persons who will oppose what has been said. One of these does not think proper to explore any other design in the Parmenides than exercise through opposite arguments, or to introduce in this dialogue a crowd of arcane and intellectual dogmas which are foreign from its intention. But the other sort, who are more venerable than these, and lovers of forms, assert that one of the hypotheses is about the first god, another about the second god, and the whole of an intellectual nature, and a third about the natures posterior to this, whether they are the more excellent genera, or souls, or any other kind of beings. For the investigation of these particulars does not pertain to the present discourse. These, therefore, 
distribute three of the hypotheses after this manner, but they do not think proper to busy themselves about the multitude of gods, the intelligible and the intellectual genera, the supermundane and mundane natures, or to unfold all these by division, or busily explore them. For, according to them, though Plato in the second hypothesis treats about intellectual beings, yet the nature of intellect is one, simple and indivisible. Against both these, therefore, must he contend, who entertains that opinion of the Parmenides, which we have before mentioned. The contest, however, against these is not equal. But those who make the Parmenides a logical exercise are again attacked by those who embrace the divine mode of interpretation, and those who do not unfold the multitude of beings, and the orders of divine natures, are indeed, as Homer says, in every respect venerable and skilful men, but yet, for the sake of the Platonic philosophy, we must doubt against them, following in this our leader to the most holy and mystic truth. It is proper, likewise, to relate as far as contributes to our purpose what appears to us to be the truth respecting the hypotheses of the Parmenides, for thus perhaps by a reasoning process we may embrace the whole theology of Plato. Chapter 9 In the first place, then, let us consider those who draw down the design of this dialogue from the truth of things to a logical exercise, and see whether they can possibly accord with the writings of Plato. It is therefore evident to every one that Parmenides proposes to himself to deliver in reality the dialectic method, and that with this view he cursorily assumes it in a similar manner in each of the things which have a real being, as in sameness, difference, similitude, dissimilitude, motion and permanency, etc., exhorting at the same time those who desire to discover the nature of each of these in an orderly method to this exercise, as to a great contest. He likewise asserts that it was by no means an easy undertaking to him who was so much advanced in years, assimilates himself to the Ibician horse, and presents us with every argument to prove that this method is a serious undertaking, and not a contest consisting in mere words. How, therefore, is it possible that we can refer to empty arguments those conceptions about which the great Parmenides, evincing that they require much serious discussion, composed this discourse? How, likewise, is it reasonable to suppose that an aged man would busy himself with mere verbal contests, and that he who loved to speculate the truth of things would bestow so much study on this method, he who considered everything else as having no real existence, and who ascended to the high watch-tower of being itself. Indeed, he who admits this must suppose that Parmenides is satirized by Plato in this dialogue, by thus representing him drawn down to juvenile contests from the most intellectual visions of the soul. But, if you are willing, let us consider in addition to the above what Parmenides promises, and on what subject, engaging to speak, he entered on this discussion. Was it not, then, about being according to his doctrine, and the unity of all beings, to which, extending himself, his design was concealed from the vulgar, while he exhorts us 
to collect the multitude of beings into one undivided union. If, therefore, this is the one being, or that which is the highest, and which is perfectly established above the reasons conversant with opinion, is it not absurd to confound dogmas about intelligibles with doxastic arguments? For, indeed, such a form of discourse is not adapted to the hypothesis about true beings, nor does the intellection of unapparent and separate causes harmonize with dialectic exercises. But these differ from each other, so far as intellect is established above opinion, as Timaeus informs us, and not Timaeus only, but likewise the demoniacal Aristotle, who, discoursing on a power of this kind, exhorts us to make our investigations neither about things perfectly unapparent to us, nor about such as are more known. It is far, therefore, from being the case that Parmenides, who places the science of beings above that which appears to be truth to those who rank sense before intellect, should introduce doxastic knowledge to an intellective nature since a knowledge of this kind is dubious, various, and unstable, or that he should speculate true being with this doxastic wisdom and inane discussion, for a various form of knowledge does not harmonize with that which is simple, nor the multiform with the uniform, nor the doxastic with the intelligible. But, still further, nor must this be omitted, that such a mode of discourse is perfectly foreign from the discussion of Parmenides, for he discourses about all beings and delivers the order of wholes, their progression beginning from the one, and their conversion ending in the one. But the argumentative method is very remote from scientific theory. Does it not therefore appear that Plato must have attributed a discordant hypothesis to Parmenides, if it be said that he merely regards an exercise through opposite arguments, and that for the sake of the power employed in this exercise he excites the whole of this evolution of reasons. Indeed, it will be found that in all the other dialogues Plato attributes hypotheses to each of the philosophers adapted to their peculiar tenets. Thus to Timaeus he assigns the doctrine about nature, to Socrates that of a republic, to the Elian guest that about being, and to the priestess diatima, that respecting love. Afterwards, each of the other dialogues confines itself to those arguments which are adapted to the writings of the principal person of the dialogue. But Parmenides alone will appear to us wise in his poems, and in his diligent investigation of true being. But in the Platonic scene, he will be the leader of a juvenile muse. This opinion, therefore, accuses Plato of dissimilitude of imitation, though he himself condemns the poets for ascribing to the sons of the gods a love of money and a life subject to the dominion of the passions. How, therefore, can we refer a discussion of doxastic and empty arguments to the leader of the truth of beings. But if it be necessary that omitting a multitude of arguments we should make Plato himself a witness of the proposed discussion, we will cite, if you please, what is written in the Theatetus and Sopista, for from these dialogues what we assert will be apparent. In the Theatetus, then, Socrates, being excited by a young man to a confutation of those who assert that being is immovable, attacks, among these, 
an opinion of this kind entertained by Parmenides, and at the same time assigns the cause, quote, I blush, close quote, says he, quote, for Parmenides, who is one of these, more than for all the rest. For I, when very young, was conversant with him when he was very elderly, and he appeared to me to possess a certain profundity perfectly generous. I am afraid, therefore, lest we do not understand what has been asserted, and much more am I fearful that we fall short of the meaning of Parmenides. Close quote. With great propriety, therefore, do we assert that the proposed discussion does not regard a logical exercise, and make this the end of the whole, but that it pertains to the science of the first principles of things. For how could Socrates, using a power of this kind, and neglecting the knowledge of things, testify that the discourse of Parmenides possessed a depth perfectly generous, and what venerableness can there be in adopting a method which proceeds doxastically through opposite reasons, and in undertaking such an invention of arguments? Again, in the Sopista, exciting the Elian guest to a perspicuous evolution of the things proposed by him, and evincing that he was now accustomed to more profound discourses, quote, inform me, close quote, says he, quote, whether it is your custom to give a prolix discussion of a subject which you are able to demonstrate to any one by interrogations. I mean, such discussions as Parmenides himself formerly used, accompanied with all beautiful reasons, and of which I was an auditor when I was very young, and he was very elderly. Close quote. What reason, then, can be assigned why we should not believe Socrates when he asserts that the arguments of Parmenides were all beautiful, and possessed a generous profundity, and why we should degrade the discussion of Parmenides, hurl it from essence and being, and transfer it to a vulgar, trifling, and empty contest, neither considering that discourses of this kind are alone adapted to youth, nor regarding the hypothesis of being characterized by the one, nor anything else which opposes such an opinion. But I likewise think it is proper that the authors of this hypothesis should consider the power of dialectic, such as it is exhibited by Socrates in the Republic, how, as he says, it surrounds all disciplines like a defensive enclosure, and elevates those that use it to the good itself, and the first unities, purifies the eye of the soul, establishes it in true beings, and the one principle of all things, and ends at last in that which is no longer hypothetical. For if the power of this dialectic is so great, and the end of this path so mighty, it is not proper to confound doxastic arguments with a method of this kind. For the former regards the opinions of men, but the latter is called garrulity by the vulgar, and the one is perfectly destitute of disciplinative science, but the other is the defensive enclosure of such sciences, and the passage to it is through these. Again, the doxastic method of reasoning has for its end the apparent, but the dialectic method endeavors to arrive at the one itself always employing for this purpose steps of ascent, and at last beautifully ends in the nature of the good. By no means, therefore, is it fit 
that we should draw down to doxastic arguments a method which is established among the most accurate sciences. For the merely logical method which presides over the demonstrative fantasy is of a secondary nature, and is alone pleased with contentious discussions. But our dialectic, for the most part, employs divisions and analyses as primary sciences, and is imitating the progression of beings from the one, and their conversion to it again but it likewise sometimes uses definitions and demonstrations, and prior to these the definitive method and the dividing method prior to this. On the contrary, the doxastic method is deprived of the incontrovertible reasonings of demonstration. Is it not therefore necessary that these powers must be separated from each other, and that the discussion of Parmenides, which employs our dialectic, must be free from the empty variety of mere argument, and must fabricate its reasonings with a view to being itself, and not to that which is apparent. And thus much may suffice to answer to those who reprobate our hypotheses. For if all this cannot convince them, we shall in vain endeavour to persuade them and urge them to the speculation of things. Chapter 10 But a greater and more difficult contest remains for me against those lovers of the speculation of beings who look to the science of first causes as the end proposed in the hypothesis of the Platonic Parmenides and this contest we will accomplish, if you please, by numerous and more known arguments. And, in the first place, we shall define what that is about which our discourse against them will be employed. For this, I think, will render the mystic doctrine of Plato concerning divine natures apparent in the highest degree. There are, therefore, nine hypotheses, which are discussed by Parmenides in this dialogue, as we have evinced in our commentaries upon it. And the five precedaneous hypotheses suppose that the one has a subsistence, and through this hypothesis that all beings, the mediums of wholes, and the terminations of the progressions of things may be supposed to subsist. But the four hypotheses which follow these introduce the one, not having a subsistence according to the exhortation of the dialectic method, show that by taking away the one, all beings, and such things as have an apparent existence, must be entirely subverted, and propose to themselves the confutation of this hypothesis. And some of the hypotheses evidently conclude everything according to reason, but others, if I may be allowed the expression, perfectly evince things more impossible than impossibilities, which circumstance some prior to us perceiving, as it appears to me, necessarily to happen in these hypotheses, have considered it as deserving discussion in their treatises on this dialogue. With respect to the first of the hypotheses, therefore, almost all agree in asserting that Plato, through this celebrates the superessential principle of wholes as ineffable, unknown and above all being. But all do not explain the hypothesis posterior to this after the same manner. For the ancient Platonists, and those who participated the philosophy of Plotinus, assert that an intellectual nature presents itself to the view in this hypothesis, subsisting 
from the superessential principle of things, and endeavor to harmonize to the one and all perfect power of intellect such conclusions as are the result of this hypothesis. But that leader of ours to truth about the gods, and confabulator of Plato, that I may use the language of Homer, who transferred what was indefinite in the theory of the more ancient philosophers to bound, and reduced the confusion of the different orders to an intellectual distinction, in the writings which he communicated to his associates, this our leader in his treatise on the present subject calls upon us to adopt a distinct division of the conclusions to transfer this division to the divine orders and to harmonize the first and most simple of the things exhibited to the first of beings but to adapt those in the middle rank to middle natures according to the order which they are allotted among beings, and such as are last and multiform to ultimate progressions. For the nature of being is not one, simple and indivisible, but as in sensibles, the mighty heaven is one, yet it comprehends in itself a multitude of bodies, and the monad connectedly contains multitude, but in the multitude there is an order of progression, and of sensibles, some are first, some middle, and some last, and prior to these, in souls, from one soul a multitude of souls subsists, and of these, some are placed in an order nearer, but others more remote from their wholeness, and others again fill up the medium of the extremes. In like manner, it is doubtless necessary that among perfectly true beings, such genera, as are uniform and occult, should be established in the one and first cause of wholes, but that others should proceed into all multitude, and a whole number, and that others should contain the bond of these, in a middle situation. It is likewise by no means proper to harmonize the peculiarities of first natures with such as are second, nor of those that possess a subject order with such as are more unical. But it is requisite that among these some should have powers different from others, and that there should be an order in this progression of true beings, and an unfolding of second from first natures. In short, being which subsists according to, or is characterized by, the one, proceeds indeed from the unity prior to beings, but generates the whole divine genus, videreliket, the intelligible, intellectual, supermundane, and that which proceeds as far as to the mundane order. But our preceptor likewise asserts that each of the conclusions is indicative of a divine peculiarity, and though all the conclusions harmonize to all the progressions of the one being, or of being characterized by the one, yet I am of opinion it is by no means wonderful that some conclusions should more accord with some hypotheses than with others. For such things as express the peculiarity of certain orders do not necessarily belong to all the gods, but such as belong to all are doubtless by a much greater reason present with each. If, therefore, we ascribe to Plato an adventitious division of the divine orders, and do not clearly evince that, in other dialogues, he celebrates the progressions of the gods from on high to the extremity of things, sometimes in fables respecting the soul, and at other times in other theological modes, 
we shall absurdly attribute to him such a division of being, and together with this of the progression of the one. But if we can evince from other dialogues that he, as will be manifest in the course of this work, has celebrated all the kingdoms of the gods, in a certain respect is it not impossible that in the most mystic of all his works he should deliver through the first hypothesis the exempt transcendency of the one with respect to all the genera of beings, to being itself, to a psychical essence, to form, and to matter, but that he should make no mention of the divine progressions and their orderly separation? For if it is proper to contemplate last things only, why do we touch on the first principle before other things? Or, if we think fit to unfold the multitude of the proper hypotheses, why do we pass by the genus of the gods, and the divisions which it contains? Or, if we unfold the natures subsisting between the first and last of things, why do we leave unknown the whole orders of those divine beings, which subsist between the one, and natures that are in any respect deified. For all these particulars evince that the whole discourse is defective, with respect to the science of things divine. But still farther, Socrates, in the Philebus, calls upon those that love the contemplation of beings to use the dividing method, and always to explore the monads of total orders, and the duads, triads, or any other numbers proceeding from these. If this, then, is rightly determined, it is doubtless necessary that the Parmenides, which employs the whole dialectic method, and discourses about being which is characterized by the one, should neither speculate multitude about the one, nor remain in the one monad of beings, nor in short introduce to the one, which is above all beings, the whole multitude of first beings immediately, but should unfold as in the first order such beings as have an occult subsistence and are allied to the one, but as in the middle rank those genera of the gods which subsist according to progression, and which are more divided than the extremely united, but are allotted a union more perfect than such as have proceeded to the utmost, and should unfold as in the last rank such as subsist according to the last division of powers, and together with these such as have a deified essence. If, therefore, the first of the hypotheses is about the one which is above all multitude, it is doubtless necessary that the hypothesis which follows this should not unfold being itself in an indefinite and indistinct manner, but should deliver all the orders of beings. For the dividing method does not admit that we should introduce the whole of multitude at once to the one as Socrates teaches us in the Philebus. Besides, we may evince the truth of what we assert from the very method of the demonstrations. For the first of the conclusions become immediately manifest from the least, most simple, most known, and as it were, common conceptions. But those which are next in order to these become apparent through a greater multitude of conceptions, and such as are more various, and the last conclusions are entirely the most composite, for he always uses the first conclusions as subservient to the demonstration of those that follow, and presents us with an intellectual paradigm of the order observed in geometry, or other disciplines in the connection of these conclusions with each other. If, therefore, 
discourses bring with them an image of the things of which they are interpreters, and if, as are the evolutions from demonstrations, such must the order necessarily be of the things exhibited, it appears to me to be necessary that such things as derive their beginning from the most simple principles must be in every respect of a more primary nature, and must be arranged as conjoined with the one. But that such as are always multiplied and suspended from various demonstrations must have proceeded farther from the subsistence of the one. For the demonstrations which have two conclusions must necessarily contain the conclusions prior to themselves, but those which contain primary, spontaneous, and simple conceptions are not necessarily united with such as are more composite, which are exhibited through more abundant media, and which are farther distant from the principle of beings. It appears, therefore, that some of the conclusions are indicative of more divine orders, but others of such as are more subordinate, some of more united, and others of more multiplied orders, and again some of more uniform, and others of more multiform progressions. For demonstrations are universally from causes and things first. If, therefore, first are the causes of second conclusions, there is an order of causes and things caused in the multitude of the conclusions. For, indeed, to confound all things and speculate them indefinitely in one, neither accords with the nature of things nor the science of Plato. End of chapter 10「Chapters 11 and 12 of Book 1 of Platonic Theology by Proclus Translated by Thomas Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Again, therefore, let us discuss this affair in another way, and view with the dianoetic power where anything futile is delivered. For, let it be said, if you please, and we will first of all allow it, that the conclusions of this second hypothesis are about true being. But, as this is multitude, and not only one itself, like the one prior to beings, for being is that which is passive to the one, as the Elian guest in the Sopista informs us, and, as it is universally acknowledged by our opponents, who establish that which is first as the one, but intellect as one many, soul as one and many, and body as many and one. As, therefore, this has been asserted a thousand times, I mean that in true being there is multitude together with union, whether will they say that these things harmonize with the whole of being, but not with its parts, or both with the whole and its parts? And again we ask them whether they attribute all things to each part of being, or whether they ascribe different things to different parts. If, therefore, they are of opinion that each particular should alone harmonize with the whole of being, being will consist of non-beings, that which is moved of things immovable, that which abides of things deprived of permanency, and universally all things will consist of their opposites, and we shall no longer agree with the discourse of Parmenides, who says that the parts of being characterized by the one are in a certain respect wholes, and that each of them is one and being, 
in a manner similar to the whole. But if we attribute all things to each part, and there is nothing which we do not make all things, how can the summit of being, and that which is most eminently one, contain a wholeness and an incomprehensible multitude of parts? How can it at one and the same time contain the whole of number, figure, motion, and permanency, and in short all forms and genera? For these differ from each other, and the hypothesis will assert things impossible. For things near to will be similarly multiplied with things remote from the one, and that which is first will not be a less multitude than that which is last. Nor again will the last of things be a less one than the first, and things in the middle will have no difference with respect to division from the extremes. As, therefore, it is not proper to ascribe all this multitude of conclusions to the whole alone, nor to consider all things in a similar manner in all the parts of being, it remains that different conclusions must harmonize with different things. It is necessary, therefore, that either the enumeration of the conclusions should be inordinate or ordinate. But if they say they are inordinate, they neither speak agreeably to the dialectic method, nor to the mode of demonstrations which always generate things secondary from such as are first, nor to the science of Plato, which always accompanies the order of things. But if they say the conclusions are regular, I think it is entirely necessary that they should either begin from things first according to nature, or from things last. But if from things last, being characterized by the one will be the last, and that which is moved according to time the first. This, however, is impossible. For that which participates of time must by a much greater priority participate of first being. But that which participates of first being does not necessarily participate of time. First being, therefore, is above time. If, then, Plato begins from first being, but ends in that which participates of time, he proceeds supernally from the first to the last parts of true being. Hence, the first conclusions are to be referred to the first orders, the middle, for the same reason, to the middle orders, and the last, as is evident, to such as are last. For it is necessary, as our discourse has evinced, that different conclusions should be assigned to different things, and that a distribution of this kind should commence from such things as are highest. But, likewise, the order of the hypotheses, as it appears to me, is a sufficient argument of the truth of our assertion. For with us, the one, which is exempt from all multitude, is allotted the first order, and from this the evolution of all the arguments commences. But the second order after this is about true beings, and the unity which these participate, and the third order in regular succession is about soul. Whether, therefore, is it about every soul or not? In answer to this, we shall observe that our leader, Surianus, has beautifully shown that the discourse about whole souls is comprehended in the second hypothesis. If, therefore, the order of these three hypotheses proceeds according to the nature of things, it is evident that the second is produced from the first, and the last from the second. For I would ask those who are not entirely unskilled in discourses of this kind, what can be more allied to the one than 
being characterized by the one, which the first of the conclusions of the second hypothesis unfolds. Or what can be more allied to soul than that which participates of time, which subsists divisibly, and which is the last thing exhibited in this hypothesis? For the life of partial as well as of total souls is according to time, and first being is that which participates of the one, and through its connection with being has a redundant hyparxis with respect to the imparticipable unity. But if this hypothesis is the middle, and if we aptly harmonize the highest conclusions with things highest, we should doubtless harmonize middles with middles. For this hypothesis, commencing from first being, proceeds through all the genera posterior to it, till it ends in a nature participating of time. But, farther, from the common confession of those interpreters of Plato, who were skilled in divine concerns, we can demonstrate the same things as we have above asserted. For Plotinus, in his book on Numbers, inquiring whether beings subsist prior to numbers, or numbers prior to beings, clearly asserts that the first being subsists prior to numbers, and that it generates the divine number. But if this is rightly determined by him, and being is generative of the first number, but number is produced by being, it is not proper to confound the order of these genera, nor to collect them into one hypostasis, nor, since Plato separately produces first being, and separately number, to refer each of the conclusions to the same order. For it is by no means lawful that cause and the thing caused should have either the same power or the same order. But these are distinct from each other, and the science concerning them is likewise distinct, and neither the nature nor the definition of them is one and the same. But after Plotinus, Porphyry, in his treatise on principles, evinces by many and beautiful arguments that intellect is eternal, but that at the same time it contains in itself something prior to the eternal, and through which it is conjoined with the one. For the one is above all eternity, but the eternal has a second, or rather third order in intellect. For it appears to me to be necessary that eternity should be established in the middle of that which is prior to the eternal and the eternal. But of this hereafter. At the same time, thus much may be collected from what has been said, that intellect contains something in itself better than the eternal. Admitting this, therefore, we ask the father of this assertion whether this something better than the eternal is not only being characterized by the one, but is a whole, and parts, and all multitude, number, and figure, that which is moved, and that which is permanent, or whether we are to ascribe some of the conclusions to it, but not others. For it is impossible that all these can accord with a nature prior to eternity, since every intellectual motion, and likewise permanency, are established in eternity. But if we are to ascribe some of the conclusions to it, and not others, it is evident that other orders in intellect are to be investigated, and that each of the conclusions is to be referred to that order, to which it appears particularly adapted. For intellect is not one in number, and an atom, as it appeared to be to some of the ancients. 
but it comprehends in itself the whole progression of first being. But the third, who makes for our purpose after these, is the divine Iamblichus, who, in his treatise concerning the gods, accuses those who place the genera of being in intelligibles, because the number and variety of these is more remote from the one. But afterwards he informs us where these ought to be placed. For they are produced in the end of the intellectual order by the gods which there subsist. How the genera of being, however, both are and are not in intelligibles, will be hereafter apparent. But if, according to his arrangement of the divine orders, intelligibles are exempt from the genera of being, much more are they exempt from similitude and dissimilitude, equality and inequality. Each of the conclusions, therefore, ought not in a similar manner to be accommodated to all things, so as to refer them to the whole breadth of the intelligible or intellectual order. Hence, from what the best of the interpreters have said, when philosophizing according to their own doctrines, both the multitude of the divine orders and of the platonic arguments are to be considered as proceeding according to an orderly distinction. In addition, likewise, to what has been said, this also may be asserted, that we cannot, on any other hypothesis, obtain a rational solution of the many doubts which present themselves on this subject, but shall ignorantly ascribe what is rash and vain to this treatise of Plato. For, in the first place, why are there only so many conclusions, and neither more nor less? For there are fourteen conclusions. But, as there are so many, we cannot assign the reason of this unless we distribute them in conjunction with things themselves. In the second place, neither shall we be able to find the cause of the order of the conclusions with respect to each other, and how some have a prior and others a posterior establishment according to the reason of science, unless the order of the conclusions proceeds in conjunction with the progression of beings. In the third place, why do some of the conclusions become known from things proximately demonstrated, but others from preceding demonstrations? For that the one is a whole and contains parts is demonstrated from being, which is characterized by the one. But its subsistence in itself and in another is placed in a proximate order, after the possession of figure, but is demonstrated from whole and parts. Or why are some things often demonstrated from two of the particulars previously evinced, but others from one of them? For we shall be ignorant of each of these, and shall neither be able scientifically to speculate their number, nor their order, nor their alliance to each other, unless, following things themselves, we evince that this whole hypothesis is a dialectic arrangement, proceeding from on high through all the middle genera, as far as to the termination of first being. Again, if we should say that all the conclusions demonstrate syllogistically only, in what respect shall we differ from those who assert that the whole of this discussion consists of doxastic arguments, and only regards a mere verbal contest? But if it is not only syllogistic, but likewise demonstrative, it is doubtless necessary that the middle should be the cause of 
and by nature prior to the conclusion. As, therefore, we make the conclusions of the preceding reasons, the media of those that follow, the things which the arguments respect must doubtless have a similar order as to being, and their progeny must be the causes of things subject, and generative of such as are secondary. But if this be admitted, how can we allow that all of them have the same peculiarity and nature? For cause, and that which is produced from cause, are separated from each other. But this likewise will happen to those who assert that one nature is to be explored in all the arguments, that they will by no means perceive how in the three first conclusions the one remains unseparated from being, but is first separated in the fourth conclusion. But in all the following conclusions the one is explored considered as subsisting itself by itself. Is it not therefore necessary that these orders must differ from each other? For that which is without separation, in consequence of having an occult and undivided subsistence, is more allied to the one. But that which is separated has proceeded farther from the first principle of things. Again, if you are willing to consider the multitude of the arguments, and the extent of the hypothesis, how much it differs from that which follows it, neither from this will it appear to you to be entirely about one and an unseparated nature. For reasonings about divine concerns are contracted in the more principal causes because in these the occult is more abundant than the perspicuous, and the ineffable than the known. But they become multiplied and evolved by proceeding to divine orders more proximate to our nature. For such things as are more allied to that which is ineffable, unknown, and exempt in inaccessible places, are allotted an hyparxis, more foreign from verbal enunciation. But such things as have proceeded farther are both more known to us and more apparent to the fantasy than such as have a prior subsistence. This, therefore, being abundantly proved, it is necessary that the second hypothesis should unfold all the divine orders and should proceed on high from the most simple and unical to the whole multitude, and all the number of divine natures in which the order of true being ends, which indeed is spread under the unities of the gods, and at the same time is divided in conjunction with their occult and ineffable peculiarities. If, therefore, we are not deceived in admitting this, it follows, that from this hypothesis the continuity of the divine orders, and the progression of second from first natures, is to be assumed, together with the peculiarity of all the divine genera. And indeed, what their communion is with each other, and what their distinction, proceeding according to measure, Likewise, the auxiliaries, which may be found in other dialogues respecting the truth of real beings, or the unities which they contain, are all to be referred to this hypothesis. For here we may contemplate the total progressions of the gods, and their all-perfect orders, according to theological science. For, as we have before shown, that the whole treatise of the Parmenides has reference to the truth of things, and that it was not devised as a vain evolution of words, it is doubtless necessary that the nine hypotheses which it discusses, 
employing the dialectic method, but speculating with divine science, should be about things and certain natures, which are either middle or last. If, therefore, Parmenides acknowledges that his whole discourse will be about the one, and how it subsists with respect to itself and all other things, it is evident that the speculation of the one must commence from that which is highest, but end in that which is the last of all things. For the hyparxis of the one proceeds from on high, as far as to the most obscure hypostasis of things. Chapter 12. As the first hypothesis, however, demonstrates by negations the ineffable supereminence of the first principle of things, and evinces that he is exempt from all essence and knowledge, it is evident that the hypothesis after this, as being proximate to it, must unfold the whole order of the gods. For Parmenides does not alone assume the intellectual and essential peculiarity of the gods, but likewise the divine characteristic of their hyparxis through the whole of this hypothesis. For what other one can that be which is participated by being than that which is in every being divine, and through which all things are conjoined with the imparticipable one? For as bodies through their life are conjoined with soul, and as souls through their intellective part are extended to total intellect, and the first intelligence, in like manner true beings through the one which they contain are reduced to an exempt union, and subsist in unproceeding union with this first cause. But because this hypothesis commences from that which is one being, or being characterized by the one, and establishes the summit of intelligibles as the first after the one, but ends in an essence which participates of time, and deduces divine souls to the extremities of the divine orders, it is necessary that the third hypothesis should demonstrate, by various conclusions, the whole multitude of partial souls, and the diversities which they contain. And thus far the separate and incorporeal hypostasis proceeds. After this follows that nature which is divisible about bodies, and inseparable from matter, which the fourth hypothesis delivers supernally suspended from the gods, and the last hypothesis is the procession of matter, whether considered as one or as various, which the fifth hypothesis demonstrates by negations according to its dissimilar similitude to the first. But sometimes, indeed, the negations are privations, and sometimes the exempt causes of all the productions. And, what is the most wonderful of all, the highest negations are only enunciative, but some in a supereminent manner, and others according to deficiency. But, each of the negations consequent to these is affirmative, the one paradigmatically, but the other iconically, or after the manner of an image. But the middle corresponds to the order of soul, for it is composed from affirmative and negative conclusions, but it possesses negations coordinate to affirmations nor is it alone multiplied, like material natures, nor does it possess an adventitious one, but the one which it contains, though it is still one, yet subsists in motion and multiplication, and in its progressions is, 
as it were, absorbed by essence. And such are the hypotheses which unfold all beings, both separable and inseparable, together with the causes of wholes, as well exempt as subsisting in things themselves, according to the hyparxis of the one. But there are four other hypotheses besides these, which, by taking away the one, evince that all things must be entirely subverted, both beings and things in generation, and that no being can any longer have any subsistence, and this in order that he may demonstrate the one to be the cause of being and preservation, that through it all things participate of the nature of being, and that each has its hyparxis suspended from the one. And in short, we syllogistically collect this through all beings, that if the one is, all things subsist as far as to the last hypostasis, and if it is not, no being has any subsistence. The one, therefore, is both the hypostatic and preservative cause of all things, which Parmenides also himself collects at the end of the dialogue. With respect, however, to the hypothesis of the Parmenides, its division, and the speculation of its several parts, we have sufficiently treated in our commentaries on that dialogue, so that it would be superfluous to enter into a prolix discussion of these particulars at present. But, as from what has been said, it appears whence we may assume the whole of theology, and from what dialogues we may collect into one the theology distributed according to parts. We shall, in the next place, treat about the common dogmas of Plato, which are adapted to sacred concerns, and which extend to all the divine orders, and shall evince that each of these is defined by him according to the most perfect science. For things common are prior to such as are peculiar, and are more known according to nature. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of Platonic Theology by Proclus Translated by Thomas Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 In the first place, therefore, we shall assume the things which are demonstrated in the laws, and contemplate how they take the lead with respect to the truth about the gods, and are the most ancient of all the other mystic conceptions about a divine nature. Three things, therefore, are asserted by Plato in these writings, that there are gods, that their providence extends to all things, and that they administer all things according to justice, and suffer no perversion from worse natures. That these, then, obtain the first rank among all theological dogmas is perfectly evident. For what can be of a more leading nature than the hyparxis of the gods, or than boniform providence, or immutable and undeviating power, through which they produce secondary natures uniformly, preserve themselves in an undefiled manner, and convert them to themselves. But the gods, indeed, govern other things, but suffer nothing from subordinate natures, nor are changed with the variety of the things to which their providence extends. We shall learn, however, how these things are defined according to nature, if we endeavor to embrace by a reasoning process the scientific method of Plato about each of them, and prior to these, survey, 
by what irrefragable arguments he proves that there are gods, and thus afterwards consider such problems as are conjoined with this dogma. Of all beings, therefore, it is necessary that some should move only, but that others should be moved only, and that the natures situated between these should both move and be moved. And, with respect to these last, it is necessary either that they should move others, being themselves moved by others, or that they should be self-motive. These four hypostases, likewise, are necessarily placed in an orderly series one after another. That which is moved only and suffers, depending on other primary causes. That which moves others, and is at the same time moved, being prior to this. That which is self-motive, and which is beyond that which both moves and is moved, beginning from itself and through its own motion imparting the representation of being moved to other things, and that which is immovable, preceding whatever participates either producing or passive motion. For everything self-motive, in consequence of possessing its perfection in a transition and interval of life, depends on another more ancient cause, which always subsists according to sameness, and in a similar manner, and whose life is not in time but in eternity, for time is an image of eternity. If, therefore, all things which are moved by themselves are moved according to time, but the eternal form of motion is above that which is carried in time, the self-motive nature will be second in order, and not the first of beings but that which moves others, and is moved by others, must necessarily be suspended from a self-motive nature, and not this alone, but likewise every alter-motive fabrication, as the Athenian guest demonstrates. For if all things, says he, should stand still, unless self-motive natures had a subsistence among things, there would be no such thing as that which is first moved. For that which is immovable is by no means naturally adapted to be moved, nor will there then be that which is first moved. But the alter mode of nature is indigent of another moving power. The self mode of nature, therefore, alone, as beginning from its own energy, will move both itself and others in a secondary manner for a thing of this kind imparts the power of being moved to alter motive natures, in the same manner as an immovable nature imparts a motive power to all beings. In the third place, that which is moved only must, first of all, be suspended from things moved by another, but moving others, for it is necessary both that other things and the series of things moved which extends in an orderly manner from on high to the last of things, should be filled with their proper media. All bodies, therefore, belong to those things which are naturally moved only, and are passive, for they are productive of nothing, on account of possessing an hypostasis endued with interval, and participating of magnitude and bulk since everything productive and motive of others naturally produces and moves by employing an incorporeal power. But of incorporeal natures some are divisible about bodies, but others are exempt from such a division about the last of things. Those incorporeals, therefore, which are divisible about the bulks of bodies, whether they subsist in qualities or in material forms, belong to the number of things moved by another, but at the same time moving others. For these, because they possess an incorporeal allotment, participate of a mode of power, but because they are divided about bodies, are deprived of the power of verging to themselves, are divided together with their subjects, and are full of sluggishness from these. They are indigent of a mode of nature 
which is not borne along in a foreign seat, but possesses an hypostasis in itself. Where, therefore, shall we obtain that which moves itself? For things extended into natures, possessing bulk and interval, or which are divided in these, and subsist inseparably about them, must necessarily either be moved only, or be motive through others. But it is necessary, as we have before observed, that a self-motive nature should be prior to these, which is perfectly established in itself, and not in others, and which fixes its energies in itself, and not in things different from itself. There is, therefore, another certain nature exempt from bodies, both in the heavens and in these very mutable elements, from which bodies primarily derive the power of being moved. Hence, if it be requisite to discover what such an essence as this is, rightly following Socrates, and considering what the end of things is, which, by being present to alter motive natures, imparts to them a representation of self-motion, to which of the above-mentioned natures shall we ascribe the power of things being moved from themselves? For all inanimate natures are alone alter-motive, and whatever they suffer, they are adapted to suffer through a certain power externally moving and compelling. It remains, therefore, that animated natures must possess this representation, and that they are self-motive in a secondary degree, but that the soul which is in them primarily moves itself and is moved by itself, and that through a power derived from itself, as it imparts life to bodies, so likewise it extends to them from itself a representation of being moved by themselves. If, therefore, the self-motive essence is more ancient than alter-motive natures, but soul is primarily self-motive, from which the image of self-motion is imparted to bodies, soul will be beyond bodies, and the motion of every body will be the progeny of soul and of the motion it contains. Hence it is necessary that the whole heaven and all the bodies it contains, possessing various motions and being moved with these different motions, according to nature, for a circulation is natural to every body of this kind, should have ruling souls which are essentially more ancient than bodies, and which are moved in themselves, and supernally illuminate these with the power of being moved. It is necessary, therefore, that these souls which dispose in an orderly manner the whole world, and the parts it contains, and who impart to everything corporeal, which is of itself destitute of life, the power of being moved, inspiring it for this purpose with the cause of motion, should either move all things conformably to reason, or after a contrary manner, which it is not lawful to assert. But if indeed this world, and everything in it which is disposed in an orderly manner, and is moved equally and perpetually according to nature, as is demonstrated, partly in the mathematical disciplines, and partly in physical discussions, is suspended from an irrational soul, which, moving itself, moves also other things, neither the order of the periods, nor the motion which is bounded by one reason, nor the position of bodies, nor any other of those things which are generated according to nature, will have a stable cause, and which is able to distribute everything in an orderly manner and according to an invariable sameness of subsistence. For everything irrational is naturally adapted to be adorned by something different from itself and is indefinite and unadorned in its own nature. But to commit all heaven to a thing of this kind, and a circulation revolving according to reason, and with an invariable sameness, is by no means adapted either to the nature of things or to our undisciplined conceptions. If, however, an intellectual soul, 
and which employs reason governs all things and if everything which is moved with a perpetual lashing is governed by a soul of this kind and there is no one of the wholes in the universe destitute of soul for no body is honourable if deprived of such a power as this as theophrastus somewhere says if this be the case whether does it possess this intellectual perfect and beneficent power according to participation or according to essence for if according to essence it is necessary that every soul should be of this kind since each according to its own nature is self-moto but if according to participation there will be another intellect subsisting in energy more ancient than soul which essentially possesses intellection and by its very being pre-assumes in itself the uniform knowledge of wholes since it is also necessary that the soul which is essentialized according to reason should possess that which pertains to intellect through participation and that the intellectual nature should be twofold the one subsisting primarily in a divine intellect itself but the other which proceeds from this subsisting secondarily in soul to which you may add if you please the presence of intellectual illumination in body for whence is the whole of this heaven either spherical or moved in a circle and whence does it revolve with the sameness of circulation according to one definite order for how could it always be allotted the same idea and power immutably according to nature if it did not participate of specific formation according to intellect for soul indeed is the supplier of motion but the cause of a firm establishment and that which reduces the unstable mutation of things that are moved into sameness and also a life which is bounded by one reason and a circulation which subsists with invariable sameness will evidently be superior to soul body therefore and the whole of the sensible nature belong to things which are alter motive but soul is self motive binding in itself all corporeal motions and prior to this is intellect which is immovable let no one however suppose that i assert this immobility of intellect to resemble that which is sluggish destitute of life and without respiration but that it is the leading cause of all motion and the fountain if you are willing so to denominate it of all life both of that which is converted to itself and of that which has its hypostasis in other things through these causes also the world is denominated by timaeus an animal endued with soul and intellect being called by him an animal according to its own nature and the life pervading to it from soul and which is distributed about it but animated or endued with soul according to the presence of a divine soul in it and endued with intellect according to intellectual domination for the supply of life the government of soul and the participation of intellect connect and contain the whole of heaven if however this intellect is essentially intellect since timaeus indicating that the essence of intellect is the same with its intellection denominates it divine for he says that soul receiving a divine intellect led an upright and wise life if therefore this be the case it is necessary that the whole world should be suspended from its divinity and that motion indeed should be present to this universe from soul but that its perpetual permanency and sameness of subsistence should be derived from intellect and that its one union the conspiration in it and sympathy and its all-perfect measure should originate from that unity from which intellect is uniform soul is one every being is whole and perfect according to its own nature and everything secondary together 
with perfection in its own proper nature participates of another more excellent peculiarity from an order which is always established above it for that which is corporeal being alter motive derives from soul the representation of self-motive power and is through it an animal but soul being self-motive participates of a life according to intellect and energizing according to time possesses a never-ceasing energy and an ever-vigilant life from its proximity to intellect and intellect possessing its life in eternity always subsisting essentially in energy and fixing all its stable intellection at once in intellect is entirely deific through the cause prior to itself for it has twofold energies as plotinus says some as intellect but others as being inebriated with nectar and elsewhere he observes that this intellect by that which is prior to itself and is not intellect is a god in the same manner as soul by its summit which is above soul is intellect and as body by the power which is prior to body is soul all things therefore as we have said are suspended from the one through intellect and soul as media and intellect indeed has the form of unity but soul has the form of intellect and the body of the world is vital but everything is conjoined with that which is prior to itself and of the natures posterior to these one in a more proximate but the other in a more remote degree enjoys that which is divine and divinity indeed is prior to intellect being primarily carried in an intellectual nature but intellect is most divine as being deified prior to other things and soul is divine so far as it requires an intellectual medium but the body which participates of a soul of this kind so far as body indeed is also itself divine for the illumination of divine light pervades supernally as far as to the last dependencies yet it is not simply divine but soul by looking to intellect and living from itself is primarily divine my reasoning is also the same about each of the whole spheres and about the bodies they contain for all these imitate the whole heaven since these likewise have a perpetual allotment and with respect to the sublunary elements they have not entirely an essential mutation but they abide in the universe according to their wholenesses and contain in themselves partial animals for every wholeness has posterior to itself more partial essences as therefore in the heavens the number of the stars proceeds together with the whole spheres and as in the earth the multitude of partial terrestrial animals subsists together with their wholeness thus also it appears to me to be necessary that in the wholes which have an intermediate subsistence each element should be filled up with appropriate numbers for how in the extremes can wholes which subsist prior to parts be arranged together with parts unless there is the same analogy of them in the intermediate natures but if each of the spheres is an animal and is always established after the same manner and gives completion to the universe as possessing life indeed it will always primarily participate of soul but as preserving its own order immutable in the world it will be comprehended by intellect and as one and a whole and the leader and ruler of its proper parts it will be illuminated by divine union not only the universe therefore but each also of its perpetual parts is animated and endued with intellect and as much as possible is similar to the universe for each of these parts is a universe with respect to its kindred multitude in short there is indeed one corporeal formed wholeness of the universe 
but there are many others under this depending on this one there is one soul of the universe and after this other souls together with this disposing in an orderly manner the whole parts of the universe with undefiled purity one intellect and an intellectual number under this participated by these souls and one god who connectedly contains at once all mundane and supermundane natures and a multitude of other gods who distribute intellectual essences and the souls suspended from these and all the parts of the world for it is not to be supposed that each of the productions of nature is generative of things similar to itself but that wholes and the first of mundane beings should not in a much greater degree extend in themselves the paradigm of a generation of this kind for the similar is more allied and more naturally adapted to the reason of cause than the dissimilar in the same manner as the same than the different and bound than the infinite these things however we shall accurately survey in what follows but we shall now direct our attention to the second of the things demonstrated in the laws we dedelicet that the gods providentially attend at once to wholes and parts and shall summarily discuss the irreprehensible conception of plato about the providence of the gods End of chapter 13chapters fourteen to sixteen of book one of platonic theology by proclus translated by thomas taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen from what has been said therefore it is evident to every one that the gods being the causes of all motion some of them are essential and vivific according to a self-motive self-vital and self-energetic power but others of them are intellectual and excite by their very being all secondary natures to the perfection of life according to the fountain and principle of all second and third progressions of motion and others are unical or characterized by unity deifying by participation all the whole genera of themselves according to a primary all perfect and unknown power of energy and who are the leaders of one kind of motion but are not the principle of another but again others supply to secondary natures motion according to place or quality but are essentially the causes of motion to themselves for everything which is the cause of essence to other things is much prior to this the cause to itself of its own proper energies and perfection farther still that which is self-motive is again the principle of motion and being and life are imparted by soul to everything in the world and not local motion only and the other kinds of motion but the progression into being is from soul and by a much greater priority from an intellectual essence which binds to itself the life of self-motive natures and precedes according to cause all temporal energy and in a still greater degree do motion being and life proceed from a unical hyparxis which connectedly contains intellect and soul is the source of total good and proceeds as far as to the last of things for of life indeed not all the parts of the world are capable of participating nor of intellect and a gnostic power but of the one all things participate as far as to matter itself both wholes and parts 
things which subsist according to nature, and the contraries to these. And there is not anything which is deprived of a cause of this kind, nor can anything ever participate of being, if it is deprived of the one. If, therefore, the gods produce all things and contain all things in the unknown comprehensions of themselves, how is it possible there should not be a providence of all things in these comprehensions, pervading supernally as far as to the most partial natures? For it is everywhere fit that offspring should enjoy the providential care of their causes. But all alter-motive are the progeny of self-motive natures, and things which subsist in time, either in the whole of time, or in a part of it, are the effects of eternal natures, because that which always is, is the cause of that which sometimes exists. And divine and unical genera, as they give subsistence to all multiplied natures, precede them in existence. In short, there is no essence or multitude of powers which is not allotted its generation from the one. It is necessary, therefore, that all these should be partakers of the providence of preceding causes, being vivified, indeed, from the psychical gods, and circulating according to temporal periods, and participating of sameness, and at the same time a stable condition of forms from the intellectual gods, but receiving into themselves the presence of union, of measure, and of the distribution of good from the first gods. It is necessary, therefore, either that the gods should know that a providential care of their own offspring is natural to them, and should not only give subsistence to secondary beings, and supply them with life, essence, and union, but also previously comprehend in themselves the primary cause of the goods they contain, or, which it is not lawful to assert, that being gods, they are ignorant of what is proper and fit. For what ignorance can there be of beautiful things, with those who are the causes of beauty, or of things good, with those who are allotted an hyparxis defined by the nature of the good? But if they are ignorant, neither do souls govern the universe according to intellect, nor are intellects carried in souls as in a vehicle, nor prior to these do the unities of the gods contractedly comprehend in themselves all knowledge which we have acknowledged they do through the former demonstrations. If, therefore, they are not deprived of knowledge, being the fathers, leaders, and governors of everything in the world, and to them as being such a providential care of the things governed by, and following them, and generated by them, pertains, whether shall we say that they, knowing the law which is according to nature, accomplish this law, or that through imbecility they are deprived of a providential attention to their possessions or progeny. For it is of no consequence, as to the present discussion, which of these two appellations you are willing to adopt. For if through want of power they neglect the superintendence of wholes, what is the cause of this want of power? For they do not move things externally, nor are other things indeed the causes of essence, but they assume the government of the things they have produced, but they rule over all things as if from the stern of a ship, themselves supplying being themselves containing the measures of life, 
and themselves distributing to things their respective energies. Whether also are they unable to provide at once for all things, or they do not leave each of the parts destitute of their providential care. And if they are not curators of everything in the world, whether do they providentially superintend greater things, but neglect such as are less? Or do they pay attention to the less, but neglect to take care of the greater? For if we deprive them of a providential attention to all things similarly, through the want of power, how, while we attribute to them a greater thing, we derelicet, the production of all things? Can we refuse to grant that which is naturally consequent to this, a providential attention to their productions? For it is the province of the power which produces a greater thing to dispose in a becoming manner that which is less. But if they are curators of less things, and neglect such as are greater, how can this mode of providence be right? For that which is more allied, and more similar to anything, is more appropriately and fitly disposed by nature to the participation of the good, which that thing confers on it. If, however, the gods think that the first of mundane natures deserve their providential care, and that perfection of which they are the sources, but are unable to extend their regard to the last of things, what is it which can restrain the presence of the gods from pervading to all things? What is it which can impede their unenvying and exuberant energy? How can those who are capable of affecting greater things be unable to govern such as are less? Or how can those who produce the essence even of the smallest things not be the lords of the perfection of them through a privation of power? For all these things are hostile to our natural conceptions. It remains, therefore, that the gods must know what is fit and appropriate, and that they must possess a power adapted to the perfection of their own nature, and to the government of the whole of things. But if they know that which is according to nature, and this to those who are the generating causes of all things is to take care of all things, and an exuberance of power, if this be the case, they are not deprived of a providential attention of this kind. Whether, also, together with what has been said, is there a will of providence in them? Or is this alone wanting, both to their knowledge and power? And on this account are things deprived of their providential care? For if indeed knowing what is fit for themselves, and being able to accomplish what they know, they are unwilling to provide for their own offspring, they will be indigent of goodness. Their unenvying exuberance will perish, and we shall do nothing else than abolish the hyparxis according to which they are essentialized. For the very being of the gods is defined by the good, and in this they have their subsistence. But to provide for things of a subject nature is to confer on them a certain good. How, therefore, can we deprive the gods of providence without at the same time depriving them of goodness? And how, if we subvert their goodness, is it possible that we should not also ignorantly subvert their hyparxis, which we established by the former demonstrations? Hence, it is necessary to admit as a thing consequent to the very being of the gods, that they are good according to every virtue. And again, it is consequent to this, that they do not withdraw themselves from a providential attention to secondary natures, either through indolence, or imbecility, or ignorance. 
but to this i think it is also consequent that there is with them the most excellent knowledge unpolluted power and an envying and exuberant will from which it appears that they provide for the whole of things and omit nothing which is requisite to the supply of good let however no one think that the gods extend such a providence about secondary things as is either of a busy or laborious nature or that this is the case with their exempt transcendency which is established remote from mortal difficulty for their blessedness is not willing to be defiled with the difficulty of administration since even the life of good men is accompanied with facility and is void of molestation and pain but all labors and molestation arise from the impediments of matter if however it be requisite to define the mode of the providence of the gods it must be admitted that it is spontaneous unpolluted immaterial and ineffable for the gods do not govern all things either by investigating what is fit or exploring the good of everything by ambiguous reasonings or by looking externally and following their effects as men do in the providence which they exert on their own affairs but pre-assuming in themselves the measures of the whole of things and producing the essence of everything from themselves and also looking to themselves they lead and perfect all things in a silent path by their very being and fill them with good neither likewise do they produce in a manner similar to nature energizing only by their very being unaccompanied with deliberate choice nor energizing in a manner similar to partial souls in conjunction with will are they deprived of production according to essence but they contract both these into one union and they will indeed such things as they are able to effect by their very being but by their very essence being capable of and producing all things they contain the cause of production in their unenvying and exuberant will by what busy energy therefore with what difficulty or with the punishment of what ixion is the providence either of whole souls or of intellectual essences or of the gods themselves accomplished unless it should be said that to impart good in any respect is laborious to the gods but that which is according to nature is not laborious to any thing for neither is it laborious to fire to impart heat nor to snow to refrigerate nor in short to bodies to energize according to their own proper powers and prior to bodies neither is it laborious to natures to nourish or generate or increase for these are the works of natures nor again prior to these is it laborious to souls for these indeed produce many energies from deliberate choice many from their very being and are the causes of many motions by alone being present so that if indeed the communication of good is according to nature to the gods providence also is according to nature and these things we must say are accomplished by the gods with facility and by their very being alone but if these things are not according to nature neither will the gods be naturally good for the good is the supplier of good just as life is the source of another life and intellect is the source of intellectual illumination and everything which has a primary subsistence in each nature is generative of that which has a secondary subsistence that however which is especially the illustrious prerogative of the platonic theology i should say is this 
that according to it neither is the exempt essence of the gods converted to secondary natures through a providential care for things subordinate nor is their providential presence with all things diminished through their transcending the whole of things with undefiled purity but at the same time it assigns to them a separate subsistence and the being unmingled with every subordinate nature and also the being extended to all things and the taking care of and adorning their own progeny for the manner in which they pervade through all things is not corporeal as that of light is through the air nor is it divisible about bodies in the same manner as in nature nor converted to subordinate natures in the same manner as that of a partial soul but it is separate from body and without conversion to it is immaterial unmingled unrestrained uniform primary and exempt in short such a mode of the providence of the gods as this must at present be conceived for it is evident that it will be appropriate according to each order of the gods for soul indeed is said to provide for secondary natures in one way and intellect in another but the providence of divinity who is prior to intellect is exerted according to a transcendency both of intellect and soul and of the gods themselves the providence of the sublunary is different from that of the celestial divinities of the gods also who are beyond the world there are many orders and the mode of providence is different according to each chapter fifteen the third problem after these we shall connect with the former and survey how we are to assume the unpervertible in the gods who perform all things according to justice and who do not in the smallest degree subvert its boundary or its undeviating rectitude in their providential attention to all other things and in the mutations of human affairs i think therefore that this is apparent to every one that everywhere that which governs according to nature and pays all possible attention to the felicity of the governed after this manner becomes the leader of that which it governs and directs it to that which is best for neither has the pilot who rules over the sailors and the ship any other precedaneous end than the safety of those that sail in the ship and of the ship itself nor does the physician who is the curator of the diseased endeavor to do all things for the sake of anything else than the health of the subjects of his care whether it be requisite to cut them or administer to them a purgative medicine nor would the general of an army or a guardian say that they look to any other end than the one to the liberty of those that are guarded and the other to the liberty of the soldiers nor will any other to whom it belongs to be the leader or curator of certain persons endeavor to subvert the good of those that follow him which it is his business to procure and with a view to which he disposes in a becoming manner everything belonging to those whom he governs if therefore we grant that the gods are the leaders of the whole of things and that their providence extends to all things since they are good and possess every virtue how is it possible they should neglect the felicity of the objects of their providential care or how can they be inferior to other leaders in the providence of subordinate natures since the gods indeed always look to that which is better and establish this as the end of all their government 
but other leaders overlook the good of men and embrace vice rather than virtue in consequence of being perverted by the gifts of the depraved and universally whether you are willing to call the gods leaders or rulers or guardians or fathers a divine nature will appear to be in want of no one of such names for all things that are venerable and honorable subsist in them primarily and on this account indeed here also some things are naturally more venerable and honorable than others because they exhibit an ultimate resemblance of the gods but what occasion is there to speak further on this subject for i think that we hear from those who are wise in divine concerns paternal guardian ruling and peonian power celebrated how is it possible therefore that the images of the gods which subsist according to nature regarding the end which is adapted to them should providentially attend to the order of the things which they govern but that the gods themselves with whom there is the whole of good true and real virtue and a blameless life should not direct their government to the virtue and vice of men and how can it be admitted on this supposition that they exhibit virtue victorious in the universe and vice vanquished will they not also thus corrupt the measures of justice by the worship paid to them by the depraved subvert the boundary of undeviating science and cause the gifts of vice to appear more honorable than the pursuits of virtue for this mode of providence is neither advantageous to these leaders nor to those that follow them for to those who have become wicked there will be no liberation from guilt since they will always endeavor to anticipate justice and pervert the measures of desert but it will be necessary which it is not lawful to assert that the gods should regard as their final end the vice of the subjects of their providence neglect their true salvation and consequently be alone the causes of adumbrant good this universe also and the whole world will be filled with disorder and incurable perturbation depravity remaining in it and being replete with that discord which exists in badly governed cities though is it not perfectly impossible that parts should be governed according to nature in a greater degree than wholes human than divine concerns and images than primary causes hence if men properly attend to the welfare of men in governing them honoring some but disgracing others and everywhere giving a proper direction to the works of vice by the measures of virtue it is much more necessary that the gods should be the immutable governors of the whole of things for men are allotted this virtue through similitude to the gods but if we acknowledge that men who corrupt the safety and well-being of those whom they govern imitate in a greater degree the providence of the gods we shall ignorantly at one and the same time entirely subvert the truth concerning the gods and the transcendency of virtue for this i think is evident to every one that what is more similar to the gods is more happy than those things that are deprived of them through dissimilitude and diversity so that if among men indeed the uncorrupted and undeviating form of providence is honorable it must undoubtedly be in a much greater degree honorable with the gods but if with them mortal gifts are more venerable than the divine measures of justice with men also earth-born gifts will be more honorable than olympian goods and 
the blandishments of vice than the works of virtue. With a view, therefore, to the most perfect felicity, Plato, in the laws, delivers to us, through these demonstrations, the hyparxis of the gods, their providential care extending to all things, and their immutable energy, which things indeed are common to all the gods, but are most principal and first according to nature in the doctrine pertaining to them. For this triad appears to pervade as far as to the most partial natures in the divine orders, originating supernally from the occult genera of gods. For a uniform hyparxis, a power which providentially takes care of all secondary natures, and an undeviating and immutable intellect, are in all the gods that are prior to and in the world. Chapter 16 Again, from another principle we may be able to apprehend the theological demonstrations in the Republic, for these are common to all the divine orders, similarly extend to all the discussion about the gods, and unfold to us truth in uninterrupted connection with what has been before said. In the second book of the Republic, therefore, Socrates describes certain theological types for mythological poets, and exhorts his pupils to purify themselves from those tragic disciplines which some do not refuse to introduce to a divine nature, concealing in these, as in veils, the arcane mysteries concerning the gods. Socrates, therefore, as I have said, narrating the types and laws of divine fables, which afford this apparent meaning, and the inward, concealed scope, which regards as its end the beautiful and the natural in the fictions about the gods, in the first place indeed, thinks fit to evince, according to our unperverted conception about the gods and their goodness, that they are the suppliers of all good, but the causes of no evil to any being at any time. In the second place, he says that they are essentially immutable, and that they neither have various forms, deceiving and fascinating, nor are the authors of the greatest evil, lying, in deeds or in words, or of error and folly. These, therefore, being two laws, the former has two conclusions, videlicat, that the gods are not the causes of evils, and that they are the causes of all good. The second law also, in a similar manner, has two other conclusions, and these are, that every divine nature is immutable, and is established pure from falsehood and artificial variety. All the things demonstrated, therefore, depend on these three common conceptions about a divine nature, videlicet, on the conceptions about its goodness, immutability, and truth. For the first and ineffable fountain of good is with the gods, together with eternity, which is the cause of a power that has an invariable sameness of subsistence, and the first intellect, which is beings themselves, and the truth, which is in real beings. End of chapter 16